Hello and welcome to the deepest dive for MinMax. It is the best, most thorough discussion with The Last of Us Part 2 on the internet. I'm Ben Hansen and I'm joined by Jeff Marchiafaba. Hey. And then we have Charles McGregor, developer of HyperDot. Hello. Uh, Charles, let's see. Which shirt are you wearing today? You want to oh, show oh, it off oh, a little oh, bit? Oh, it's yeah. not really oh. a shirt. Oh, it's, it's a hot really MinMax yeah. sweatshirt as it's 95 degrees no. out. Cool. We have yes. Cyril Vasquez on the line too. Hello. Welcome, everybody. In this discussion, this huge community game club discussion, we are covering the third section of The Last of Us Part 2. So if you don't want any spoilers for any of The Last of Us, you've come to the wrong video. But in this discussion, we are covering everything from the end of Seattle Day 3 all the way through Seattle Day 2. <laughs> so just to make it nice and confusing for everybody, those are the chunks. Um, to get more specific on what we're talking about, leave if you don't want any spoilers. We're talking about Abby. Jeff, what are we talking about today? Talking about Abby. <laughs> <laughs> Great, you got it. Uh, okay, there's a lot to cover here. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you. Uh, thank you for your support and just watching our stuff. That's great. If you enjoy this discussion, this format, please tell a friend. Or if you really want to support the format, you could also unlock the podcast version of this by supporting us on Patreon.com. So max two ends at the $5 tier. Um, and then you get the podcast version of this, early access to the MinMax show, audio or sorry, podcast versions of our interviews, max spoilers, commentary tracks. There's a ton of goodies just piling up there. Also, we should point out that three out of the four of us were sent codes for The Last of Us Part Two by PlayStation. So uh, Charles was not. He was not cool enough is what PlayStation told us, which I think is really yeah. rude. Rude. Just I mean, I was a supporter of the Vita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not the world's biggest supporter of the Vita. That's in this section of gameplay. Uh, yeah, that's but true. There's a lot to cover here. Okay. The way this works, we're going to be reading off comments that people submitted on Patreon um, every Monday while the game club's going on. We put up a post and say, hey, let us know what thoughts you have on this section of the game. People leave comments. That's where these comments are coming from that you're going to be hearing. If you want to leave a comment for the finale, the final episode, which will be next week, you can support us at any tier, then you can leave a comment. Um, does anybody have a guess as to the most common comment, the most repeated comment for this section of The Last of Us Part Two? It is a very specific thing that I will give you a heads up on. I found very surprising. Oh. Oh, dang. Hmm. Something surprising. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, that's a big boy. <laughs> nope. You know what? They, <laughs> didn't, they didn't go back to that's a big boy. Okay. Uh, was, it, was it Abby eating that burrito? People went gaga over this burrito. They could not. No, it's not the burrito. Okay, Although there okay, are burrito okay. comments. <laughs> there are burrito comments. It is the deepest dive. So we're here to get specific and people want to get specific on that burrito. Any other guesses? Uh, the scaffolding area. Very close. Basically right there. Number one most common comment was people talking about Abby's fear of heights and how much they related to it. Mm. by okay. far and away the most common comment like, oh, it, it was mind boggling um, okay so this section here opens with a flashback four years earlier you're playing as young Abby okay um, right. broad strokes uh, Jeffem how did you feel about maybe not even this flashback but this chunk yeah. of the last of us where are you sitting on part three here of part two uh, it's it's really good. I, I, I feel like I've I feel like I finally understand uh, why everybody's been gushing about the game and yeah. what kind of makes it so special. And in in the last two sections, I've kind of talked about how it, if if this is just a revenge tale of you know Ellie going through her kill Abby list, that it was going to get old at some point. Yep, and that it needed to do something else and immediately in this section it started doing that and i and you know the gears started turning it was like okay i now now i see what's going on now i see why this is something more and um and i i feel like um it i when i started playing through abby's section it felt like i understood like the initial internal pitch for this game 
which I'm I'm making an assumption, but I'm assuming that it was, hey, can we make a game where we kill off one of our most beloved characters ever, and then throughout the course of the rest of that game, make people actually appreciate and forgive his killer Mm -hmm. by having them play through that experience with that character and starting to understand where that character was coming from. And this is the moment then when you think Sony would step up and say, are you all high? This sounds like two games. Please, for the love of God and for the love of our checkbooks, do not do this. Naughty Dog said, hey, see the name on the studio? It says Naughty Dog. What are you going to do about it? (laughs) Naughty. It is is absurd (laughs) and amazing that a game with this scope is able to be released in the video game industry. We can talk about it later. You know, some people say it's too long. I guess the next discussion next week will be a good place probably for that type of discussion. But the scope that they're going for and the ambition is just absurd. Um, I'm I'm roughly with you, Jeff, where, you know, I, I remember last week on the MinMax show, we were talking to Kyle and I asked him, hey, you know, when do you feel like The Last of Us Part Two locked in as your number one game of the year so far? And he's like, you guys are on that 60, 70% mark. I'm like, okay, I'm naturally a skeptic. But it was one of those where wrapping up this section, I was like, okay, all right, done. This is yeah. amazing. This is an incredible uh, work of art at this point. Uh, and it's just mind boggling. So I, I have yeah. leveled up in a huge way for my affection, appreciation, thoughts towards this game overall. Yeah, yeah. My The other thing I was talking about last time was how it's kind of neck and neck with Final Fantasy, and I'm going to yeah. need a couple months to kind of reflect on it. And that's that's out the window now at this point. It was like, no, no, yeah, I, I totally understand. Like, this is my front runner for game of the year at this point. Well, it's still neck and neck with Final Fantasy, but like, Last of Us has the neck of Japan. It's a giraffe neck. Uh, and then Final Fantasy VII has the giraffe neck, I think, in front of it still. But that's just from my own heart. We'll oh, see. Okay. We'll see how it shakes mm-hmm, out. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry. Uh, Surreal, did you have big thoughts on this overall section? Uh, I don't have like too many sweeping takeaways because I think there's so much of this that like it throws a lot of balls up in the air narratively where, I mean, the entire section feels like it, it is this lead up to like, okay, you have your end point and then you're kind of taken back to the start point and now you're kind of waiting to get to the end point again, right? Where right. this feels like, okay, we need to see this other side of it. So to me, it felt like this, this section felt like the most where uh narratively and mechanically it was just kind of the game is just kind of spinning its wheels uh and it gets faster and i think like it does a lot of interesting things early on uh but to me definitely kind of just got to the point where it's like okay come on let's 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 get to let's get to the point that i know happens eventually um and so like i'm not like as 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 uh like strong on it as you guys are because it felt like okay i just i want to get to it uh i want to get to the point that i know i'm gonna get to and so, like, the number of encounters and, like, the ways they, like, kind of don't really do much with, like, the gameplay at this point felt a little bit kind of like, okay, come on, let's just let's just keep going. And, and this was, to me, the point where I, I think any pretense of stuff that I had just ended up going out the window mm-hmm. in, uh, by the end of it, where I was just like, they're never going to not put you in a situation, they're never going to put you in a situation where you don't have the ammo to, to do what you need to do. On uh, normal, so, yeah. Or well, well, I mean, I'm playing on hard, right, and right. like that, that, that is still the case for me. And like even the boss fight uh, that we'll talk about later on, it, like that part of it, that side of it, like mechanically, it felt like I don't really need to play along with how the game really wants me to. Um, and so that part was, I think, this is maybe the weakest section of it for me, gameplay wise. And narratively, I can totally see like they're 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 very much calling a couple shots ahead of time. Of like, okay, well, this 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 character that you know we previously saw die, we're gonna get you to empathize with them. And I, I think I, I do kind of like a lot of the narrative beats there, but overall, this was definitely the section where I'm waiting for the next section in a lot of ways. You feel like you you know where you know where the puck's moving. You know, like yeah. okay, empathy, got it, got it. Let's get to some new gameplay, buddy. Well, I, I mean, I don't even, like, at this point, I don't necessarily expect them to, like, introduce, like, a late game, like, well, now you can time travel or anything like that. I don't, like, I don't expect the gameplay to, not, like, suddenly become more diverse. Wait for it, Serial. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, <laughs> you guys play ahead? Uh, I mean, there's going to uh, time travel. But, They're going back in time. But, like, this was more than ever the time where I was just, like, I just want to see the next story beat. I'm not, like, as interested in, like getting through, you know, the the next encounter where there's, like, a bunch of enemies on the scaffolding or whatever that 
I yeah, I, I hear you to some extent. I think they've just done such a good job of shaking up the environments in a bigger way than I was expecting. You know, even in the last discussion, it's like, okay, they're starting to get away from just the standard Seattle ferns crawling out of the yeah. grass. And in this section, I mean, every one of Abby's areas, I mean, going from like that Home Depot to Chinatown to like the scaffolding, everything was so wildly different and just had a different feel to it overall. There's a lot more reds than the blues and greens of kind of Ellie's section. And I just thought that just the visual change up alone really helped me feel like, you know, even if it's still, okay, human encounters, infected encounters, stealth scary encounters, it just cycle. It's still, mm-hmm. I feel like is, is compelling to me, but sorry, uh, yeah. Charles, where are you at overall here? Uh, overall, yeah, I do definitely lean uh, more towards like I understand why it's getting a lot more praise now. Um, yeah, this is like the oh, I understand Kyle now. Uh, <laughs> You'll never truly like, understand Kyle. Yeah, you can never really. Um, but like it, it, I, I feel like a lot more things gelled with me this time. Um, where I was like, okay, I understand combat more i understand these things more there are still things about the combat that i uh am not particularly fond of Mm. uh particularly the aiming um for the longest time i've been trying to figure out uh why why is it that i just aim just to the left of them or just to the right of people uh because you're aiming trying to it yeah it's just uh, i have the aim assist uh turned down now because Mm. i felt like i kept on overcorrecting. uh but now i feel like it's not or it's like just powerful enough to where if I overcorrect just a little bit more than I aim just off and then I miss shooting and then I waste all my ammo. Are you still, but, uh, are you still playing with an audience? Uh, yes, I am still playing with an audience. I cannot wait to talk about certain sections later with that audience. I think it's going to be interesting. Um, should, yeah. <laughs> should we dive into this flashback a little bit? Work our way sure. chronologically through this section. So four years earlier, you're with Abby's dad, who that's what I remember in the last discussion. When maybe it was just me, but we're like, "Oh, he's going to get eaten so hard by those infected. This is going to be crazy." And then, no, no, no. It turns out it's just Joel that ends up killing him as well. <laughs> uh, so it all makes sense. Uh, Spencer Botine wrote in saying, "I just wanted to take a moment and recognize that my prediction about Abby's origin was correct. Her father was the doctor. I will now hold for applause." Yeah, I and I I totally I pooped that up last time where I was like, oh, you know, we often think that video game worlds are much smaller than they have to be, and not everyone is someone else's dad. And yeah, it turns out sometimes it is. Your <laughs> yes, uh, I thought that. for sure that once I saw that section, I was like, oh, that person wrote in about it. Do we have another Final Fantasy VII situation where I think somebody is cheating? But I will believe this person that that was just a, a guess out of the blue and a very good guess overall. Um, Sidewinder17 says, when it was revealed that Abby's father was indeed the surgeon that was supposed to be operating on Ellie, my first thought was recalling the moment in which Joel enters the operating room during part one. I thought it was odd because I believed for a moment that killing the surgeon was optional. But upon further recollection, I remembered that if you don't attack Jerry, he actually uses a scalpel to kill Joel, prompting a restart. You have to kill him in part one. There's no way around it. I can see how this could have easily been the catalyst idea that prompted Druckmann to even think about a part two. And Eric Reed uh, replied to that comment from Sidewinder saying, I sat there with my shotgun pointed at his face for a good minute before giving up and putting him down. The game does not give you a choice, much like Nora in this game. Uh, Jerry was the hardest final boss I've ever encountered in a game for The Last of Us Part 1. Good point overall. Uh, Also, Trace Levos says, if any of you are Friday Night Light fan, Friday Night Lights fans, Abby's dad looks just like Billy Riggins, who's played by actor Derek Phillips. My wife, who cares not a bit about video games, stopped dead when I was playing the flashback scene with a zebra and said, why is Billy Riggins in your game? Sure enough, after a quick Google, uh, Derek Phillips is the actor behind Jerry. So I guess, unlike last week's discussion around Shannon Woodward, sometimes the actors do look like their characters. That's nice. Also, a couple people corrected me that apparently for The Last of Us Part Two, Naughty Dog has been doing full uh, motion capture for the face it's not oh, hand okay. animated apparently there's a hand animation pass uh, at some point in that process but apparently they've been talking about that for a while so i feel bad for not being on top of naughty dog development here um during this section i you know i was so excited to get to it to see what this was going to be like to learn a little bit more about abby's past and then that zebra scene it's like okay naughty dog loves their circus animals mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's you know it's a nice way of 
making you more connected to the father, get the sympathy across, and also have a little bit of that magic of the disconnect. And it helps that the location where that scene takes place, it's like, okay, it's not like they're in, uh, you know, Maine, and there's just happens to be a zebra out there too. It's like, it's all- Okay, don't your comments about Maine. I just want to say that that I, I stand with all the people who like Maine and its scenery. It's a, a I'm wonderful I'm just saying place. I'm glad no one talks about Maine in this game. I'm glad nobody in the comments is a defender of Maine. I'm glad there's not a single Patreon supporter <laughs> from Maine. Lord knows they can start Maine Max whenever they want, but they're not welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, so, did anybody else have thoughts on this flashback section here? I thought the the scene with the zebra is like a really good kind of use of like let's let's have this take place from a video game perspective because it oh, we, it didn't really feel like a cutscene and it kind of does instill this fear of like here's this weird situation that I have not encountered in many games where I don't know necessarily what to do like it's it's way less because like that zebra is tied up in that wiring so like you already see like. This is going to be painful to fix, mm-hmm. like because those mm-hmm. wires are like deeply embedded. And it's not like Resident Evil Four where you can just walk up to the dog and like set him loose from the trap, right? This feels a lot uh, more brutal in that sense. And I like that it's mm-hmm. it is not like a hey, you ran into this thing, play the cutscene where it very quickly happens. It is like a lot. That scene goes on for a little longer than you expect it to, and it kind of does linger on like, oh man, like this is really messed up. And also it helps build, you know. Uh, your father up as like, oh, th- oh, this is this is a character who cares about other people beyond just being a doctor. You know why this game's effective, Serial? It's because you said your father instead of Abby's father. Oh, interesting. Well, yeah. I'd like to reveal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, somebody left a comment saying that there's no way that zebra wouldn't bite the hell out of <laughs> all the family that were trying to free him because apparently zebras like biting. Like I remember reading this book. He was like guns, germs, and steel. I forget what it was. But in some book, they talked about how some British prince, uh, some jerk, uh, went to Africa in like the 1800s and was like, zebras are awesome. And so he got a bunch of zebras to bring back to England. And then he had zebras pull his chariot through a parade just to be like, I've explored the world. Look at me. I've, I've gone to Africa. And the zebras just like lost their minds and were like biting everybody and like breaking free of his chariot. So I've always liked zebras after that because they're real mm. jerks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I liked when in this section, when they're talking about Ellie, I think it's when the dad is talking to Marlene, which was interesting to see her again from this new perspective here. Um, and they're having the discussion and you start to realize like, okay, they are talking about Ellie right now. Uh, it starts to play the classic last of us theme. I thought that was a really nice moment here. Um, and it's one of those where I need to go back and check the footage again or watch that cutscene again. But I remember it being a pretty quick gloss over for why Ellie has to die. It was just one of those things, right? Where the dad's like, ah, it's gotta be this way. Moving on. We won't ask yeah. her at all. Like we will <laughs> never ask for her consent to be part of this. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, yeah. Cure, the cure is in her brain. It's deep in there. We, we really got to go in there. If you just crack her skull there. like a pinata, it's just like pills of vaccines or yeah. however that works. Just popping out that's, of that thing. That's how vaccines work, actually. <laughs> Look, if we <laughs> kill Ellie, she will drop vaccine items. Okay? <laughs> yeah. That's just how it works. Uh, but but I, did, I did really like that retroactively like that like that conversation for the dimension that it gave the fireflies too because yeah. that was really the moment where you can see like marlene was disgusted by the idea of doing this and and mm-hmm. she was disgusted with the doctor for wanting to do this mm-hmm. and they and she just kind of begrudgingly had to agree to it and then she told him flat out like yeah i'm telling joel he deserves to know this yeah it was maybe a bad call in retrospect but god i just love throughout this section too how much you're going back to that hospital and the part that just oh i went was when the section later on where abby's having that nightmare dream i think it's the end of Mm -hmm. of day one too and it's like this twisted version of the hospital but i just love that recurring hallway it's very pt the recurring hallway the recurring sounds of the sirens like every time you're just back in there it's like oh that's right this is just the genesis for this supernova that is the last of us part two and it's such a cool idea to keep revisiting it over and over from different perspectives i mean do you guys feel like it is a little bit of a of a small world kind of thing to have yeah like the reason that abby's chasing ellie is like oh yeah this thing from the last game we obviously need to connect these two games it can't just be like you know what what you kind of thought at, at the outset of the game which was at some point joel just wronged enough people that some of them would have come to 
you know, like attack him for it, basically to get revenge. It yeah. doesn't. Nece- it didn- I don't know that it necessarily needed to be a specific like catalyst that you remember from the first game. It definitely mm-hmm. felt like, well, here's the easy. Here's like kind of the path of least resistance in connecting these two threads and may give you like that emotional, like a- as Abby, like that path pathos of like, oh no, you wronged me in a very specific way that the game lays out, and so you kind of feel a little bit better about hunting him down, but. Um, it definitely felt like a well. Here's the tidiest way we can we can it's connect the these. Tidiest, characters. but it's also yeah. I mean, if you want to, you know, this isn't a real story, and so it's tidy. But then also, how can we connect the most drama, connect the most emotions to where these characters are at? So I agree, it is a little bit convenient overall, but it's like okay, I guess worth it just to tie things together in a in a tighter bow here. Which, by the way, now that it's not true, I can say what I teased in the first discussion we had for the Last of Us Part Two where somebody left a comment that I thought was going to be 100% correct for why Abby was going after Joel, which was, um, they said that it was really weird that, um, oh, it's Joel Miller, right? Isn't that his last name? They said it a couple Mm -hmm. times um, in The Last of Us Part Two, and this commenter who, was it Ronnie Barrett, I think his name was? Um, But he commented that it was weird that they pointed it out a couple times, and then when you got to Seattle there was a list of names for Fedra agents and one of them was Private Miller. Yep. Did you recognize mm. or did you notice that? I, I noticed that too playing through. And I was like, oh, so wait, was is it going to be that he was part of this group and yeah. wronged someone during that? Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, so that was the Which, comment early on that I was scared of, of touching on because I thought it was going to be accurate, but apparently not. I mean, maybe it still could be, but that would be more convoluted and weird, but just a, <laughs> just a classic Miller coincidence. Um, James Baldwin says Seattle day one. It's amazing how something as simple as the reveal of a date can truly blow your mind uh, for when that next section opened. I'm totally with you. I thought you were going to be playing as Abby for this section or for the back half. uh, But when that popped up, I did same reaction. I had like watching Avengers Endgame when it's like five years later and it's just one of those like what like they're going years in the future and this is one of those like what like of all the things i never thought would that we'd be going back in time and maybe i was like you sir a little bit skeptical but it didn't take long before i was i was quite invested here um but james baldwin also points out that the transition from abby screaming for her dad Screaming for her dad to her standing over Joel with the golf club is one of the all-time greatest game cutscene moments. The conviction on Abby's face, the slow pulsing soundtrack underneath Ellie's pleas for Joel to get up, and the complete recontextualizing of the entire scene. The way Ellie stays out of focus in the background while we can now hear the group's dialogue regarding killing Ellie and how Abby remains fixated on Joel while it happens. Uh, Yeah, that's a good point, James. We shouldn't gloss over them showing that uh, one more time there. Um... Ronnie Barrier says, hey, I would love to hear a one-word reaction from each of you when waking up as Abby. Okay, let's see. Um, Jeff was actually pulling his eyeballs out. Did you have any reaction, or is it just like a, oh, okay. No, it it was a, I can't believe they're doing it. Like, they're actually doing this. And, And for me, it was, I think you, I can't, I can't remember exactly how it went out, but I think you, like, it was like I picked up a piece of scrap or something like that. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm picking up scrap. And then I clicked into the to the knapsack and it's like, oh, yep, there are the skill trees. Like this is this is happening now. Yep, we're in this for the long haul. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. had that reaction too. I was I was so excited for that feeling of, yeah, okay, they're doing it. Um, and just, I'm always rooting for games to swing bigger, to be more bold, to be more different. And so this was one of those moments of like, yes. I hope they pull it off, but I'm excited to have them get funky with it, as critics say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Tactical Dreamer leaves a comment on Patreon, says, Games Media definitely did a terrible job of hiding the twist of playing as Abby for half the game. Even just saying they couldn't talk about the last 12 hours of the game, 12 hours of the game was a pretty huge clue that you would not be playing the same character in the second half. I don't know that there was a reasonable way for them to discuss the game without letting people know about that embargo. I guess I'm just envious of those that got to play without that knowledge. Uh, yeah, I've been really frustrated ever since the game came out, even before the game came out, the way people are talking about the game. And it has gotten to the point where within the last week, even like Naughty Dog developers, uh, even like Laura Bailey, it's just spoiler city on twitter at this point and the game didn't come out too long ago folks 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I yeah, know I I was fortunate enough to go in without knowing that this would happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been like, yeah, I've I've had the luxury of being like, whoa, what? I didn't see that coming, uh, and and things like that. But yeah, this yeah, it's been. It's been like, oh, I don't want to go look at this or go on this or do these things that I normally do uh, because people uh, are, you know, talking. And yeah, stuff. but I agree that, you know, Games Media has really blown it or just people overall on Twitter, I guess we can generalize it. But, you know, even people are so desperate to be clever and they're not clever and they do things like, oh, I'd love a full spinoff game starring blank and blank. (laughs) Cool, I wonder who this could be. I wonder if there's going to be two central characters coming Uh, up here. uh, Dina and the zebra. (laughs) Come on down to Dina and the zebra. (laughs) Saturday morning cartoon show. Uh, I mean, I guess I haven't, I hadn't, I wasn't like beyond the things that we mentioned in the first episode. I don't, I wasn't really spoiled on anything. And by the time I got to a lot of people talking about Abby, I'd I'd already played this part of it, so it mm. it didn't spoil me. But yeah, like I think w- part of it is is that weird embargo. Um, mm. I think people, I I think with like games media people specifically, it was like a, a weirder than normal kind of thing where because they wouldn't talk about it, people had to talk about the things they couldn't talk about because I think a lot of reviews early on were like, well, there's a reason I can't go as into as much depth as I maybe would like and, and can self contain yeah. in this piece. So, like, people were talking about that embargo for not, like, super long, but for long enough that it felt like, okay, well, what are they, you know, what is this whole situation with embargoes and reviews being weird? Because I, like, GameSpot specifically ran, like, a a non-spoiler review and then a spoiler review, Mm. like, separately so they could talk about everything. And so, like, the circumstances that lead to something like that feel atypical. So, I think there was a lot, like, a, a little bit of a stress end effect in that Sony was maybe a little bit too, like, don't talk about this specific thing and then that became the talking point and so that maybe led to more spoilers than it would have otherwise but i don't know how as sony you handle that kind of thing because you know spoilers are going to get out the day the game comes out basically yeah Yeah. uh charles davis writes in and says i couldn't believe what was happening when seattle day one came up again and i thought i was going to be and what i thought was going to be another Brief perspective change kept going and going and going and going. It was only when I had Abby use the shooting gallery that it started to sink in what was happening. Then, upon seeing the skill tree in the menu and playing through that chase sequence with the scars, I slowly realized I was about to be challenged in ways I never would have thought of. Bravo, Naughty Dog. Bravo. I'm all in. Um, Andrew Burns says, This is the boldest storytelling I've ever seen in the game. As soon as I regained control of Abby, I don't think I could have been more off board with what this game was giving me. But the slight variations in gameplay, coupled with the added context of this game's character and world building, are making me enjoy the section of the game even more than the first half. I love Seven Remake dearly, but if this game can stick the landing, it may be my favorite game, period. Uh, Chris Logan says, I know I won't be alone when I say I initially hated playing as Abby. All I could think was, let's hurry up and get back to that scene in the theater so I can see what happens next. After all, how can I get invested when I know where this character ends up and I know what will happen along the way? Ellie just kills her friends, right? This changed once I found a magazine to expand Abby's skill tree and I realized we'd be here for a while. So I cleared my mind because there's no point in hate playing a game and I settled in. After that, I learned two things. Number one, Abby is kind of awesome. And number two, I have no idea where this game is going. Uh, Chris Hodge says, I get seeing the other side of things and like it a little, but it's entirely too long and just too much. Woody Nickname here says, I recognize how overdramatic this sounds, but I feel like the story of this game fell off a cliff in the second half. We reached the climactic moment the whole game has been building up to, only to then cut away to another dozen hours with a cast of characters we know and care far less about. So not not love overall. It seems like a lot of skepticism for the Abbey choice going into it. And then the community mm-hmm. is a little bit split on whether they built back up to a spot that's maybe higher than their affection for the first half of the game versus people that were just annoyed by it being dragged out a little bit too much and kind of losing enthusiasm with the combat and stealth overall. Yeah, that, that's sort of where I'm at where it, like I... I guess I wasn't as surprised by like the switch because it felt like, especially since you started playing as her and then you play as her in that flashback. And so by the time Seattle day one came up, I was like, Oh, okay. And like, it, like it felt like things locked into place of like, Oh, that's what they were doing this whole time. And versus mm-hmm. like, I can't believe like, this is an out of nowhere twist. Like I, I, I do really like the, the early parts of that, of like playing as Abby because they do such a good job of like, okay, here's a t- totally different look at this part of the world. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think it's definitely one of those things where 
because to me, like the gameplay didn't really change it. Like the location certainly did, but like the gameplay didn't change up as much. It felt like this was their chance to kind of pace the game differently. And instead yeah. of like going more for like, we're going to, we're going to try to like tell the story of Abby and then lead you to the, to the end. It felt like, well, let's just ramp up the action. Let's make it, let's have her basically half her own game uh, up until that same point, right? Where they cross mm-hmm. paths. Um, so it definitely felt like part of what I was saying earlier is just like, you kind of see because you see the end point ahead of you you're kind of like okay i just want to get there as fast as possible and there are moments that contextualize certain actions differently but it definitely felt like this was the part mostly that felt like they could have cut the number of combat encounters in half and still had that delivery be as powerful yeah yeah uh caleb bone says based on some of the reactions before release i expected the section of recontextualizing to be heavy-handed or at least more obvious I've been impressed with the way there there are connections to Ellie's time in Seattle, but they've mostly let that stuff sit and allowed the other player to draw the connections if you like. It feels less like the game is saying, look, the bad guys are people too, and you killed them. Don't you feel bad? And more like it's interested in the nuance of all sides of the story. Uh, Caleb is totally right. I mean, in terms of showing different perspectives, it's subtle, and I feel like that's the beauty of a lot of Naughty Dog games, and I think this game in particular, and especially Abby's character and Abby's section here, is just the subtlety is amazing in so many different aspects with the writing, the connections to, you know, Ellie's section. It's just, it has so much faith in the intelligence of its players in a way that no other game studio, I don't think, could pull off. It's just stunning. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe somebody like From Software, people would point to some good subtlety there or something like that. But well, you know. I mean, like... I don't know. I feel like this game can be subtle when it wants to, but there are definitely like big swings. Like uh, there's like Dina sitting next to like a a poster of Cassandra and it just being a very obvious, like she's this character. Like this is the clear analog we're making here. And then like with Abby, it does to me feel at times where it's like, yeah, we're very explicitly trying to make you empathize with someone that we want. And like at the beginning, we set her up as to be hated because like the, the way they present this stuff is very much like here's this random killer who kills you and then now who kills like this character that you like and so now we're going to do the footwork to like get you to think oh maybe like everyone has a story like mm-hmm. but that I, I think like to me the conflict there is that I, if if you're also role playing as Ellie like the circumstances that led up to Joel dying don't really matter like she still murders Joel and Ellie kind of when it goes into that confrontation kind of knowing that Joel's done some bad stuff so yeah. to me like obviously there is still like another section, but to me right now, it feels like they are kind of pulling at the, at the easy heartstring of like, if you spend enough time in someone's shoes, you will eventually become like empathetic with them. Why are you so angry, Surreal? Oh, cause she killed Joel. Oh, oh I see. Oh, okay. I guess. Oh, Checks okay. out. That, yeah. uh, Wally and Sari has an interesting take. He says, so I'm someone who got spoiled via Reddit about the fact that you get to play as Abby and that she's the one who killed Joel. I got really upset about it. And I didn't want to buy the game because it sounded really awful. I hated Abby at first. Didn't think I could co- ever come to like her, but I began to understand her motivations and I was actually rooting for her throughout her journey. This is the best chunk of the game by far. I like that. I'm curious how many other people had the reaction of reading the descriptions or getting things spoiled from Reddit and then being like, well, mm. It's almost like what Naughty Dog was saying about even if you know the bold strokes of where the story goes, like the devil's in the details. You know, there's there's some mm-hmm. charm beyond just, hey, you play as the person that kills Joel. Ta-da. Yeah. Uh, Nasir Siddiqui is a thoughtful man. Um, he says, I find it fascinating that Abby, who we've been groomed since the beginning to see as the villain, uh, collects coins, which is a decades old video games trope typically associated with par- playable hero characters. Uh, and juxtaposing that with Ellie collecting trading cards where there's literally a hero villain slider on the bottom. He's talking about how Naughty Dog might be intentionally trying to connect Abby to the idea of collecting coins as this old video game trope to make her more Mm. likable. Um, And I think there is a lot going on there that Brian W. expands upon. He says, there's this book for screenwriting called Save the Cat. It's a term for making a character likable. You make them appealing by having them do something nice, like save a defenseless animal. They have given Abby many attributes to connect her to the player, fear of heights, petting dogs, having a simple coin collection. These are all tools to create a connection to the character. However, I feel like they have unsuccessfully saved the cat and instead are creating an environment for Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, and this is from Britannica.com, quote, psychologists who have studied the syndrome believe that the bond is initially created when a captor threatens a captive's life, deliberates, and then chooses not to kill the captive. 
And this is what is seen at the start of the game with her not killing Ellie. Uh, it's later brought up by Dina, shown again in a flashback and then reinforced once more right before taking on the role of Abby. And also about Stockholm Syndrome, quote, victims live in enforced dependence and interpret rare or small acts of kindness in the midst of horrible conditions as good treatment. Just being in the world of The Last of Us is horrible conditions and the first thing you do is Abby is pet a dog. It creates an illusion of greater kindness. These are a few memorable examples. While I'm enjoying the gameplay of Abby more, I'm not being swayed by her as a character. What do you guys think? Has Abby swayed you? Was it legitimate or psychological trickery? I love how much Brian is reading mm. into this. At some mm. point, isn't all writing to get you to try and connect to a character psychological trickery? Isn't that the end goal for a lot of writers out there? But I do think there's some interesting points here. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, one thing that I did notice that uh, both Ellie and Abby uh, pet a dog uh, right in the beginning. Yeah. Where like, oh, yeah, so it's a dog. And then, yeah, you, there's some humanity uh, and whatnot. But like I've noticed if you look explicitly between the day one of Seattle to day three. Well, I don't know in day three for Abby. But um, if you look in the time of... Uh, for uh abby versus uh, ellie like abby uh in that time uh, frame was helping um helping people slash uh killing the supposed enemy of a war um but in that time like ellie was like uh murdering all of abby's friends just uh, slitting then, throats yeah yeah slitting throats uh and also like the 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 people who are on patrol uh, and stuff like that. So it's if you looked at okay, this is what Abby was doing with her time versus this is what Ellie was doing with her time. You have that. Oh well, clearly Abby is a uh, better person or something like that. But then you also have like this not necess- not baggage. What is it? This uh, stuff with you know Ellie. You have been with Ellie for attachment. Um, yeah. Yeah. You have this attachment with Ellie. You have you know how Ellie got there and why. Uh, even during the time that you were playing as Ellie up till day three, you were like, whether or not you agreed with what Ellie was doing, you can logically understand where why, or why Ellie got there. You can be like, okay, Ellie does this because of these things, and this is how Ellie's personality is, and this is Ellie's story, so Ellie would do these things. Yes. So I can understand why at this point in at day three, this is where Ellie is. And uh-huh. I think, um, yeah, I think that's what's interesting about what Naughty Dog's trying to do here is just to override your connection with Ellie with tricks or just smart character development. But I noticed like a couple things just to make you a little more connected to Abby overall. There's like, you know, the idea of her kind of being rejected by Owen, by Owen being with Mel, making her more sympathetic. I think on that front, I think works. I think even just something as simple as Abby being really supportive of Lev, you know, not questioning like, oh, wait, are you he or she? What's going on? You're just as accepting out of the gate as possible. And then just on like a game t- gameplay level, I think giving Abby the shiv from the first game ties into the player's nostalgia. I think her having great weapons, also awesome way to connect you as the player with her. And then just simple stuff like her ground stomp when uh, an infected is crawling on the ground is so awesome. It's basically just the dead space stomp and like giving that <laughs> awesome move to this character again. I just feel like they're teeing you up for like, please like this character, please. And, and it, it worked for me. I yeah. think that stomp is also Joel's stomp from the first game. Oh, is it? Okay, mm-hmm. there we go. I, I'm not totally sure, but I, I remember Joel very specifically doing a similar, if not exactly uh, s- a similar uh, stomp. Oh, so that's right. Because he said, he said, Illy, check out my dead space stomp. That's right. Yeah. Every yeah. time it was really loud, and <laughs> was all weird. the zombies heard it. It was really weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I like that to me. Like the the whole thing about like that them trying to get you to empathize with with uh, Abby by having you like pet a dog. It, it does feel a little bit like no bad person could ever pet a dog and help people. Like I think they're trying to like set up a little bit of like oh these people like people have nuances to them or whatever. But ultimately, it's like uh, yeah, like I'm sure that there are terrible people who have pet dogs before. And, you know, both Ellie and Abby, like, I don't think neither Abby or Ellie, like, fall on, like, the good side of the spectrum at this point. But I think they are doing a lot of work to say, like, to get you to rethink, like, hey, my your understanding of Ellie being purely good and anyone who would attack Joel as being purely bad. And they're working from there. And, like, I think that, to me, is the crux of the game at this point, is, is to mm-hmm. think about, like, what is good and what is bad. But, like, um, I don't know, like, sometimes it does, it does, like, there are times where they are more subtle about it than others. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
and and I think I think it's it has gotten to a point where I have spent more time having to justify Ellie's actions than than it is with Abby. And and the thing that stuck out that you know Charles was talking about a little bit is that throughout this throughout this section, Abby has been putting herself in danger in order to help other people. You know, with, mm-hmm. with Lev and Yara and with Owen, like it's always her going out and risking her neck. And at the same time, through the same section, Ellie was fighting the people that she is supposed to care most about. There were situations where she's like, yeah, okay, Jesse, if you're going to go off, you can do it yourself. Oh, Tommy's out there, you know, on my behalf. He'll, he'll take care of himself because this revenge thing is so important to me. And so it, it, you really do have to have that, that back experience with Ellie to kind of talk yourself through. I mean, when you talk about Stockholm syndrome at this point, I feel like I'm spending more time justifying what Ellie has been doing through this, as opposed to trying to justify the person that Abby is. Yeah. Do you think it's overkill to some extent? Do you think they need to recalibrate and when the storyline matches back up back in that theater, they need to bring Abby down a little bit and Ellie up a little bit again? Well, I'm super interested to see that part because we have been going on this journey where we have been understanding Abby this entire time. But when we get back to that point, like Ellie's still just in murder mode and she doesn't know any of this. And so I, I will be interested to see more specifically how Naughty Dog deals with Ellie in that section and, and figures out a way to just not make her seem super callous at that point. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is it, that that comparison between like Abby's behavior throughout those days and Ellie's uh, behavior throughout those days. The, like it does feel like it is supposed to be a reflection of the other. But like I feel like I, I keep trying to justify Ellie. But like I, 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 I honestly I think I prefer Abby as a character at this point. But like there is this subtle yeah she can be nice to she can kind of focus on being friends with with the people around her. It's because she already got her revenge. She already murdered Joel. Mm. So like Ellie yeah. is yeah. Ellie is where Abby was before. Abby killed Joel. That's so it's kind of like it's a weird comparison to make because they're in, they are in very different places emotionally. And I also, yeah. you know, the first time we saw Abby then and played as Abby, she wasn't as likable because she was still kind of a troubled right. soul. She was at yeah, like, in murder mode. Yeah, yeah, right. she was in Ellie's in murder mode. mode. Yeah, she was yeah. then where Ellie is now. Right. And so yeah. what you're saying to everybody on the internet, Surreal, is that once you murder somebody, you're just relieved. Yeah, I think it's making a really good case for you like revenge, really good person. <laughs> causing catharsis, and everything being okay. Sounds like some real. I really hope the finale is that's that, that's what they're going for. Jesus they're like, Christ, this is what we're going for. It's just yeah. written on words. This is what we're going for. <laughs> Turns out revenge is really violent. It's also super cool, guys. <laughs> I recommend yeah. it. Rory Gladstone wrote in and said, "I love the parallels between Abby and Joel." From losing companions to both ending up feeling a sense of duty to a young person that they don't know all that well to seeking redemption and protecting protecting that life, even if it means killing the people they once allied with. I think playing such a long stint of the game with Abby really lets you get into perspective. I loved it. This has easily been my favorite part of the game so far. Um, yeah, those connections are really interesting. And I guess she connects to Joel, but I was doing a lot more of just simple connections to Ellie, you know, just simple stuff of in that flashback where Owen's like, hey, I'm going to show you a secret. Come on, let's swim underwater. I'll show you the secret. It's just eventually leading to a museum, you know, aquarium slash museum, the same way that uh, Joel and Ellie did that too. Uh, or just also the, the symmetry of two big shootouts in the hotels, like the one hotel that Abby's in is the skyscraper and the other one is not, you know, all that stuff. But there's a lot of mirroring, you know. It's like poetry. It rhymes here. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Darkfish Days says, did any of you walk through a bookstore and hear Abby say, all these books, stay focused. You can come back some other time. Before that, I didn't register that she woke up in a library. I guess Abby's a bookworm? I can't tell if I like how subtle this character trait is or if I wish it were expanded on. Did you find any other hints of Abby's love of books? Uh, no, I guess I missed that one, but that is a good yeah, detail. I, again. I heard that line, but um, nothing beyond that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nick L., says, when Manny wakes Abby up in the library, she has a book called City of Thieves that she fell asleep reading. City of Thieves is a real 2008 historical fiction novel written by David Benioff about two Russian youths, one of whom is named Lev. Interesting. And then Nick L. wants to point out, too, that on the aquarium 
Oh, the aquarium donors are Naughty Dog staff. I recognized mm-hmm. Boone Cotter immediately, and the rest I was able to confirm via Twitter. Oh, that's fun. Apparently that was a sign in the aquarium. Connor writes in and says, seeing the stadium camp that the WLF have set up really literally took my breath away. The incredible amount of detail as Abby walks through the arena is nothing short of mind boggling. I love that you can clearly see why Abby is so freaking ripped. She has access to a huge gym and the WLF breeds livestock and grows their own food. It really was some of the most detail I've ever seen put into an area that you spend maybe a total of 10 to 15 minutes in. Naughty Dog is truly the top of their class in regards to world building. That being said, the burrito models definitely do not look like burritos, but I'll give them a pass on that one. <laughs> I was amazed that they went for burritos. Like, that's maybe another just aspect of world building, that the society is so advanced. They can serve a bunch of people, like a thing that has more than one ingredient. Like something as complicated <laughs> as a burrito, they are on top of here, which is mind-boggling. It, it's not a bowl of slop. It, that's right. It's a burrito a is an world. advanced thing. Yes. And... Their society is very impressive, except for one thing. That motto sucks. Their slogan sucks. May your survival be long and may your no, death be your swift. Death be... Come on. No good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's nothing that I would be like, yeah, I feel motivated to get out the door and go. Like, yeah, that, that feels a, a little yeah. heavy handed. Com- yes. I don't know. Even compared to like, uh, you know, this is the way. Just give us something punchy like Mandalorian, you know, not this paragraph of blah like slop some would say um joe clinn says hey wait a second did naughty dog sneak a whole second full length full length campaign inside of this game i really love that the world building they do with wolves at the stadium is to establish how organized their group is stadium suites are now apartments the stands have been converted into laundry stations and the field is now a pasture for livestock the constant check-in and checkout stations for the dogs guns and trucks for the wolves really have their stuff together I mean, yeah, this section was amazing. Right when you're in the little apartment area, I just Mm -hmm. looked out the window like, oh my God, I want to explore the stadium. And the fact that you get to explore a section of it at least is just perfect. And I'm such a sucker for their check-in, check-out system too, just like John here. I love that stuff. It's so fun to be like, how do they have it organized? Or even when you come down um, the seats and then see that they just have all those dog kennels, it's like, oh, because one of my notes was earlier was where are they getting all these dogs? Yeah, the idea yeah. that they have this very systemized way where you check out dogs when you need them is so cool. Yeah, there there is a little bit of like I, that section. I, like I thought it was going to go a different way, but like it felt very like. Well, I think obviously the but like the, here's a, here's someone doing it right in the same way that Jackson was, but their version is very like militaristic in terms of everything has this code. You go out and you rent your weapons, you come back and like. You know, their their motto is very much speaking to, like, this very, like, rugged fantasy of, like, outdoorism that sometimes is part of zombie fiction of, like, we're going to go out there and we're going to survive. We're going to be, like, really rugged and really, like, powerful, basically, and show these other people that we're stronger, um, mm-hmm. which comes with something like that. Like, hey, if you're going to die, it may as well be, like, a cool death, right, is sort of what that motto is speaking to. So there was a little bit of, like, is this... Like, because the WLF is like a very militaristic faction, and or at least from when you saw it as Ellie, it yeah. definitely feels like, oh, they, these guys are shoot on sight. And like, I wasn't able to like kind of let go with that when I was walking through it. So it felt like I'm basically walking through like a, a like a makeshift military base in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. right? And that, which is yeah. how they've decided to to model their things. So like, even from the get go, it felt like, okay, well, I guess you know, obviously, some people are going to create cultures that are different, but it definitely felt like, okay, these are these people are very gung ho about you know, like not only surviving, but creating like basically recreating the military inside of their little encampment. Yeah. And and I still, during that section, I still felt like I was behind enemy lines at that point, you know, because mm-hmm. it, it is still, it is still this military force that is imbuing themselves with the power and authority to go out and take over a city and shoot anyone that disagrees with them. And you get parts with Isaac later where it's like, yeah, these aren't the good guys still. Mm -hmm. And I I, I think Mm -hmm. that's the, that's the sticking point for me still most with Abby is that she has kind of bought into one organization after another, you know, like one power hungry organization after another. And that still doesn't sit super well with me with her. Well, I guess that just gives her the room to grow. Right. I mean, yeah, that's maybe where the game is going is she's, I mean, does anybody think that Isaac is not going to be the end boss here? Is that going to be that or like the mo- the mother of the Seraphite yeah. or whatever? Well, she's, well, she's dead. dead, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. She'll like come yeah. back. 
Okay. She'll be risen. From I, the I, I, didn't, I wasn't like totally sure that it was her when she died because so many of the, they all just look alike. Like everyone eat a trench coat. I can't tell them apart. That's another thing about <laughs> well, the Seraphites. It's, it's stunning that I understand having a, a cool, funky cult in the post apocalyptic world, but matching uniform seems like a tall order in the post apocalypse. And those <laughs> scars are really on top of it. They, uh, that they was their first some, priority. <laughs> they found some poncho surplus store in that. <laughs> that oh my God. Yeah. One for everybody. We did it. Uh, <laughs> God's Garage. Uh, points out a couple details that he really liked in that stadium area. He liked that the gym is called WLF Itness. Um, and he notes that there's a mobile order window in the stadium mess hall, but I don't know if 2013 had mobile ordering. Um, and then he liked that in the firing range that the figures had like fungus drawn on them to make it look like clickers and stalkers and stuff. Ah. That is fun. In that firing yeah, range, it's just the smallest little thing, but hey, it's the deepest dive, so you got to get into it. But I love that after... You shot the target. Manny shot the targets. Just that animation of him kind of like leaning over to look at how you did. It's just one of those simple things of I've never seen animation that natural in a game like this. I've never seen just that loose like, oh, let's see how you did over here. Just like this relaxed, casual slump thing. It's, it's yeah. small things, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, speaking of small things. Yeah. There was another Vita. So I was happy. Oh, was it really? Yeah. Um, uh, what's it called? The guy who got his uh, eye or, or face cut, he was playing on a Vita. Oh, well, fun! I missed that. Nice. I thought. Well, and you you also run into Vita Lady again. That's yes, later on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who's still yes. playing Vita? Yeah. She can't stop playing yeah. Vita. Um, is it too much? I really wish that when you saw Abby's room, it'd be kind of cool if she had a 360 in there, right? <laughs> Just for like the split between Abby and Ellie. Is it too much to ask for? Uh, or that she went on forums, started posting on uh, like Resetera and talking about how the Xbox, like, all the PS4 fanboys suck or whatever. Yeah. PS3 yeah. fanboys, sorry, at this point. Yeah, yeah, at this point, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess well, well, yeah. Uh, PC. Yeah, Abby, Abby doesn't like video games at all. She said so. Did she really? Right. Yeah, yeah a- after talking to Vita Lady, she walked away going, fing video games. Oh, really? I don't think I talked to Vita Lady. I mean, I saw her in the cutscene, but I didn't go out of my way to talk to her, apparently, which seems crazy. I can't believe I, I missed that. Okay, then never mind. She goes on those same forums who post video games are lame right, over and right. over in yeah. every thread. Mm-hmm. You guys should be getting yeah. ripped. Yeah. <laughs> if you play yeah. video games, you think you can look like this? She just links to bodybuilding forums all the time. Like, you guys should be talking about this stuff instead. <laughs> and PVs. <laughs> MPDs, how you like these? Uh, yep. Yeah, is the implication then that after Abby's father died is when she really started hitting the gym? Just like that's when she realized, like, okay, this is a mission of vengeance now, and I need to work out. It's basically yeah. Sarah Connor in Terminator Two, right? Like now yeah. I got my mission. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, yeah, it felt like it was uh, training to build up to that moment. Yeah. Also, I guess I never got a good idea of how Ab- how old Abby is, even like between those four years, because it seemed like she was maybe even in that first last fact, it felt like she was maybe like eighteen, but it felt like they were playing her a little bit younger. But I don't know. Mm. How, yeah, I, I, I didn't get a 20s, good guess of how old she is. I guess yeah, lower twenties. Yeah, and there there. there was a section where she looked young, and it was like four months earlier. And it was- what four months yeah because like right now like in the current moment like in in the seattle sections it definitely feels like she'd she'd be like 28 to 30 Mm. but like in that flashback it was like it said like four years earlier and she looked like she was like 18 which is weird yeah so i don't i i have no idea how old she is yeah i think it's just younger 20s i think it's a it's a hard life out there uh mark swan uh is in love with the base and he points out that uh, he had like some janky interactions with the NPCs where they just like wouldn't stop nodding. Um, <laughs> and he says, uh, I guess it doesn't matter how many A's your AAA game has, both Final Fantasy VII Remake and The Last of Us Part Two both have janky random NPCs, LOL. I understand if you really look up close at some of these NPCs, they might start to break down compared to the other models in the game. But at the same time, walking around these bases, I cannot believe that they have that many people that look that good in a small area. I had the same thought in like the streets of Midgar with Final Fantasy VII, but I think this one in particular is like, everybody's moving so much. It's packed. It's, you know, like Jackson, I guess. It's just a repeat of that amazement mm. that they were able to squeeze so many people in there. The burrito line alone. Oh, the yeah. burrito line alone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Braden, Sitting in line for the burrito, and I'm like, oh, wow, this is going to be a while. And then, yeah, we cut in line. Can you yeah, and, and I also like that yeah. Abby was very uncomfortable with that. Yeah. She's like, oh, yeah. geez, come on, don't do not do this. Yeah. I, so she doesn't budge. That's a point in her. <laughs> there you one go. Of those tricks, a hero trick. 
I feel like I would kill a clicker now to get a burrito. Can you imagine in that world how much you would crave a burrito? <laughs> it would be orgasmic. It would just be on another level. Well, maybe their burritos suck. I don't know. I don't know if yeah, Seattle's known for their burritos. You can also imagine getting to the point where you're you take those burritos for granted, where you're like, yeah, I look. I know that the world is basically really screwy right now, but like, man, burritos again? <laughs> <laughs> Where's my gruel? Uh, yes. Brayden Summers says, I truly believe that when you take control of Abby in the stadium, the game showcases its best sequence thus far. The player is subjected to an environment where you see a gym, a school, plenty of food, hygiene, a range of clothes, a positive atmosphere. Then you think back to Jackson and see basically the same thing. It begs the question, did society even need a cure in order to rebuild? Would it really have been worth it to deny a young girl a chance at life? What do you guys think? Well, that seems like the the big question of these games, yeah. right? <laughs> the, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it is nice that they go out of their way to show two fully functioning societies, even if, you know, mm -hmm. one's a little bit, well, very militaristic in its structure. Yeah. yeah, it's also like the weird thing of, I guess they haven't done, like, you see the the thing with Tommy where you're kind of shooting out these little outposts that are just kind of a little more sparse, but it definitely does feel like... It, it does the very common zombie thing of like, well, in, in the wake of, you know, society falling apart, people are just kind of clustered in these areas and, you know, don't go outside because th like the, you know, outside of the safe confines of the city, everything is super dangerous. And that's where, mm -hmm. you know, things mm -hmm. can get tricky. And so everyone is very tense and, and on site with each other a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but it, it like it does show the parallels of like, here are two kind of examples of, of ways that people can make things work in the wake of, you know, the, um, the outbreak. Yeah. yeah, and and it it is worth mentioning that the it's not the WLF who is who is like whole hog on this idea of finding and creating a cure. Like they yeah. they brought with that with them from the fireflies, and so yeah. from the WLF perspective, they are just trying to kind of rebuild a society and give themselves security and stuff. Isaac like that, so. is the cure. Yeah. Uh, he's Zeon, something. He's something. <laughs> Zeon Gonzalez says, I loved being in the cafeteria and hearing the girl try to persuade her friend to read Harry Potter. It feels like a conversation I had with my friends not too long ago after rewatching the movie since my childhood. Uh, I love when you just get done fighting infected and love. Oh, also this is another section. I love when you just get done fighting, infected, and Lev reminds you to relax. I felt personally attacked since my heart rate was up from the previous encounter. Yeah, let's jump ahead <laughs> a little bit, but that's a good point, too. Um, I guess I missed the Harry Potter thing. Did they do the, yeah, me too. the very uh, Naughty Dog move of describing something in great detail, but not saying exactly what the name of it is? Uh, I did not. I did not encounter this. Yeah, okay. if I did. I don't remember. I, yeah, yeah. Um, Joe Kefchinski says at the very beginning of day one, when Abby is walking through corridors with Manny, they pass by a couple classrooms. The teacher stands at the front of the class, talking, writing, calling on students, and acting things out. Kids raise their hands, talk, and squirm in their seats. I watched through the window for probably two minutes and didn't see a single repeated animation. Naughty Dog had included an entire classroom scene with a dozen characters that almost nobody is actually going to see. The real kicker? When I stepped away from the window, I turned to see that on the other side of the hall, another completely different class is taking place. <laughs> That's just Goodness. silly. But Final Fantasy VII had their really? lovely classroom too. Yeah, that unnecessary amount of detail is always really weird. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua Duproy says, I didn't think it was possible, but I think I actually enjoyed the cast of secondary characters that you pal around with as Abby more than Ellie's main group. The trio of Owen, Manny, and Mel and their interactions with Abby have been some of my favorites so far. By the way, did anybody manage to save a screenshot of Manny's love letter before he snatches it from Abby? I tried to reload the checkpoint, but the letter is already gone from the environment, and my last manual save was about an hour ago. I don't think I, I saw this letter. I, I guess you can see a love letter, and Manny snatches yeah, it out of your hands. It's in, it's in some side area that you're going through, and you know you pick it out and do the kind of normal rotating things, but... But Abby's just kind of like, what is this? And then he comes in and snatches it. Kind of like the workbench moment, except you don't get murdered during it. And, and thirstier. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Aiden says, it's very fun seeing manga and anime in stores throughout the game and then finding that Manny has a bunch of it in his living quarters and mentions watching anime during the gameplay at a time. Um, yeah. That was one of those things where I, I had, you know, going back to, was it Brian's comment earlier? That was one of those moments where I'm like, okay, 
Everybody needs a defining characteristic. I got it. Manny likes anime, but anime. <laughs> still fun. Like I still, my heart skipped a beat when he was describing Princess Mononoke. And it's like, oh, what? yeah. In the like, Last yeah. of Us, they're talking about Princess Mononoke. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did appreciate that. Like I think for me, Manny was kind of a mixed bag because he did he he falls into a lot of pitfalls that I personally have with like Latinx characters, where it's like I'm going to talk to you, but then also like I'm just going to insert a, a Spanish word that you already yeah. know. Yeah. But like I'm going to use to like kind of let you remind you that I'm Latino. You know and like yeah a lot of the ways that he was kind of like a little bit of a lover boy with like oh i was already dating the teacher but and then i i think he talks to you about having you know had sex with someone else as well and then like just a lot of the ways he interjects like spanish always felt like very unnatural like obviously like you know people speak spanish in very many different ways but it did feel like like th this feels like a very standard when when put into fiction when people talk like this, it definitely feels like they want to let you know that this person is Latino and they, they kind of want to let you in on a little bit of what it's like to be Latino is that you speak Spanish sometimes and that's weird. Uh, so like, it definitely felt like, like they're trying to let kind of like their core demographic, which in a lot of cases is white to let you know what it's like to be Latino. And this is like a really clunky way of doing it. Uh, also, as, as Abby, like the, the one thing that I didn't like about it is that at one point she just calls him a pendejo, and it's like not. It's just like a, the context in which that's in feels a little bit like, all right, you, you guys are friends, but I don't know either of you well enough for for that to really be effective. It felt like a little bit like, man, he's always kind of peppering in Spanish, and then the second she tries to do it, it's like it's not that. It's not like that, you know. Like it's mm -hmm. it, it doesn't huh. work that way. Uh, yeah, somebody mm -hmm. wrote in last week. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to the comment, but somebody wrote in that they said the exact same thing as you. Um, uh, I think they're from Columbia. I forget where they're from, but they said like, yeah, that scene where Manny like spits on Joel after he dies and he calls him a pendejo. It's like, it's just, it just seems so cliche. I've just had so much of it. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's not so much about like, it, would, it act, would, would a Latino person actually speak like this and more about like, this is the way that, it, it, that it's almost always deployed in fiction. And I yeah. think he's he's better. I, I think he does have like nuance. He does like you know he likes anime, which is like a nice uh, <laughs> personal character note. Yeah. But it does. It, so it feels a little bit improved from what we've seen of like, for example, Jackie and Cyberpunk. Yep. Exactly. But it it, it it does feel frustrating that it still falls into those tropes of like, it, this is this is Latino, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So it, I, I don't know what the like what the staff makeup of Naughty Dog is, obviously. Um, but it didn't it didn't feel like this is a character that speaks to kind of my experiences being Latino. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's something Naughty Dog thought a lot about, talked a lot about, and noticing the care they've put to so many different aspects in this game. I can't imagine that they are weighing it, being like, I don't know, Latin character, fart, put him in there. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, ultimately the result here is that it does, it, it feels kind of clunky in a lot of ways. Okay. Cause I think, yeah. I think he's better than a lot of other like Latino characters and that he's, you know, not like a typical, like, you know, a lot of times, especially in like shooters and stuff, it's just like, Oh, they have like Spanish barks and that's about as much culture as we're willing to invest here. <laughs> sure. Uh, but it is still like frustrating, which makes like them falling into those pitfalls even more frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing like the level of polish on everything else. And then that one th or like the, the things that they don't hit the mark on are the things that are like, oh, well, uh, yeah, it, it feels you feel more a, a little bit more excluded because of that. Yeah. The um, on a lighter note, I don't understand why they don't say the names of things. Why are they dancing around Princess Mononoke? Why are they dancing on Jurassic Park? Because I remember visiting Obsidian for the South Park RPG back in 2011. And they were so excited because this is ancient history now, but I don't know if you recall, but the Supreme Court back in 2011, I believe, there was that case that was like, oh, it turns out video games are protected under free speech. And that was like a big news story in the video game industry back in 2011. And I remember the Obsidian developers were like, oh, that's really great for our game because we have like an interface going through an app and now we can just call it Facebook because it's protected under free speech and it's understood that it's a parody so we can just call it Facebook and that'll be great. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine this would be a similar thing, right? It just seems like video games are still scared to say the names of other media and I don't know why that is compared to other media out there. Yeah. I don't I don't know either. That's a, yeah. that's a good point. But I, mean, I wonder... Oh, good. Uh, well, I'm sure... I mean, it just comes down to... Are do Sony's lawyers want to risk that? And yeah. and are they sure. the one? They're the ones who are going to have to deal with it if if something happens. So I'm sure if you if if they go to Naughty Dog and be like, hey, you can have your dinosaur conversation, just so don't say Jurassic Park because we don't want to get sued or whatever. Like, do does Naughty Dog then want to die on Jurassic Park Hill, or is that something that they can easily talk 
talk around. By talk the around, way, yeah. um, when I hit 83, please make sure that I die on Jurassic Park Hill. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. That's like that yeah. famous movie, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I also wonder how much of it is like if they went like like full on and just ref, like na- name dropped everything, if it would sound a little bit annoying of like, oh, they, they want to throw in all these references because they're nerds. Well, just it throw one in. A- just one. Just break that barrier, please. Yeah, I, I think it, <laughs> I think they could definitely do with just like straight up naming the thing occasionally, but I almost find it a little bit more fun to like be like, okay, what is that referencing to? Even if it's like totally obvious for there to be yeah. a little bit of like... Okay, I had to do a little bit of work to understand that reference, so it doesn't feel like they're just like, and they, like there's Overwatch or like you know Ready Player <laughs> One kind of stuff. Yeah. Where it's oh like, look, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. like for, for it to just be a, a series of names that they that they talk about. Yeah, I love sure. that climactic scene in Ready Player One where they screamed, "There's Overwatch." No. <laughs> That's may they it may as well have been. I know. <laughs> uh, <sighs> that that movie could have just been two hours of like a text scroll of just naming different <laughs> things from the nineties and two thousand different logos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Cookman says, "On paper, I really do love the subversive." perspective switch to abby but i just could not bring myself to care uh, care about anyone around her turns out the faceless indistinct goons who murder joel are not much more than interest not much more interesting than faceless indistinct soldiers of a pseudo fascist military commune in seattle uh what do you all think of the the companions for this section of the game here the wl companions i agree somewhat with that but when we first met Owen, I was really not hot on him. Yep. Like I, I thought he he just kind of seemed like a lame character, and he really grew on me in this section. Yes, even mm-hmm. like the flashback with the hunting. Yeah, because he's in that one, right? Yeah, because they're talking a little bit about Owen and stuff. I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And then I think it's just the subtlety of his performance really won me over by the end until, I mean, I like Abby, but Owen's definitely up there for this section. Um, mm-hmm. Muffin Crumbs uh, submitted a comment on Patreon and said, "Hey, how hyped were you for more Melface, Hanson? Well, Muffin Crumbs, I was over, right. over the moon about the return of that Melface. <laughs> Love that Melface, and I didn't even think about it really until a little ways into Seattle Day One. We're like, oh, Mel's alive. Okay, this will be great. We get to interact with <laughs> this character more. Um, and it wasn't. So you until just th- find it unnerving. Like, what, what was it about? I think uh, she just has a really this? interesting face for a video game character. It's just like a little. It's not beautiful. It's a little asymmetric. Her <laughs> eyes are a little bit different than most characters. I think she's. Just Is got this a, like a weird backhanded compliment? You have a really interesting face. It doesn't go well when <laughs> I tell people in real life that. But uh, yeah. so Mel, Minnesota. I'm gonna go ahead and scream <laughs> that she has an interesting face. Um, but it took me a while before I was like, oh wait a minute. Also, that's Ashley Birch. Okay. Uh, and then I couldn't yeah. unhear it because Ashley Birch, she's very talented, very funny, but there's a certain breathy quality to her voice acting where it's just, it's got that Birch breath. Mm-hmm. Just after every line, before every line, there's a little extra breath that she does in every performance I've ever heard from her, at least. Maybe not, you know, uh, yeah. Tina from Borderlands, but. I have that a lot with Laura Bailey's, though. Like, oh, really? Oh, just like, I always, like, she's in that tier of actor that I hear her so much, and I have seen enough, like, videos of her, like, recording that whenever I hear a line from her, it just feels like, oh, I just imagine for a second, uh, like, her in the in the booth versus, like, oh, this feels like the character, right? I spend yeah, most of my time that. trying to think about how she was Kid Trunks. <laughs> so I can't, every time I hear her acting, I'm like, this is Kid Trunks? I can't. Just go Super Saiyan. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, what Mel overall is interesting. I I like the way again. It's it's pretty subtle here, but I like just the added tension between Abby and Mel, and trying to piece together how much that is coming from her being a medic. It reminds Abby of her dad, and that makes her a little bit uncomfortable as well. Then also just like you know, uh, Abby pulling from that medical experience later on when dealing with Yara, and it's like, okay, here, Mel's helping out. I feel like Mel has a surprisingly strong presence through a lot of this game, just through these mm-hmm. connections and avenues yeah. flowing through the social system. Uh, also, I liked how horrified Mel was by uh, Joel's death and, like, Joel's yeah. torture overall. Um, she's like, well, I'm a medic. I'm not a grunt. Like, I'm not used to this kind of stuff. Um, Donnie says, I think the best part of this game so far is the cast of characters around the ones you play as. Lev was an absolute delight in this section, and I hope he turns out okay. However, the successful implementation of supporting characters makes the sections where you travel alone almost unbearable for me. This may be my lack of interest in the horror genre at large, but I feel like the game is missing its main appeal when you're alone. 
Yes. I know that uh, for a lot of like uh, people who enjoy Naughty Dog games, the back and forth conversations with whoever is along for the ride uh, is like a huge draw. That's you know, it. A huge yeah. appeal. Yeah. So I can understand that comment, and I and I do think that there is a certain thing that is uh, gone when that happens, when it's just you. Um, but then it, I think it uh, shifts over to using something else. Uh, as like okay we're gonna use this as the way that you will be engaged or or entertained and stuff like that uh whether it be like oh the level design or um just the the visual fidelity of something or something like that yeah and i feel like it's another way just for naughty dog to change things around and shake things up so yeah i like i like Mm. the buddy system classic naughty dog formula here but yeah i don't mind the solo sections i think it's kind of fun yeah um Although I do miss them in combat because I've had yeah. probably five moments in this game so far where it's just like, a, oh, yes, thank you for taking that person out. That's just a yeah. perfect timing there. <laughs> um, well, I like the this section where you run around with, with Manny in kind of the Home Depot looking area. Um, and I love that in particular moment where you're like held down in what, a gas station by the scars and mm-hmm. then like the WLF come to save the day. And it's like, it's such a good way to exemplify the shifting perspective about like okay now here comes a huge swarm of wlf and it's like oh thank god okay i don't have to fight this yeah. huge squad um and then manny yells out he's like i love you guys i'm gonna name all my children after you yeah <laughs> a fun line uh hurley 13 tank says so in ellie's story after killing a dog i distinctly remember a woman crying out bear no and being absolutely gutted but then in Abby's story, I played fetch with Bear, and it turns out I'm an even bigger monster than I had originally thought. So my question is, how am I supposed to sleep at night? Um, they're just like pixels and stuff. You don't got to worry about you, that. You get like melatonin at your local oh, yeah. grocery store. It, it helps, <laughs> but you know sometimes you wake up drowsy. Or you could just adopt That's... a dog and name it Bear. Bear too. There you go. Bear, bear too. Bear too. T o o. I I had the exact same thought with um. Lucy, when when you were first going through that section with Lucy, because yeah. you know the dogs running around saving you and stuff, and I was like, oh, they're gonna kill this dog. And then when we got to the base, the person who came out, I thought he was the, I thought he was the patrolling guy in front of the hospital, and I was like, oh shit, no, I killed Lucy. And so I was waiting for that to catch up, but then Lucy ended up being in the aquarium later, and so, and then I and then I realized that Bear was Bear was the one that I had killed instead and it's like well okay I, I still feel pretty bad about that but first not as bad first of all it's alice not lucy you're close oh yeah whatever but, it's a dog <laughs> but white max white max it would come to either but white yeah. max writes in saying the worst part was realizing that the dog ellie kills in the aquarium is alice did you realize yeah. that jeff um? did you you killed that dog too yeah this is a dog yeah, that jumps on you jump scare dogs yeah oh alice yeah is but you, you don't have dog. a choice with that one right no. uh i guess not uh yeah you know with, with bear the bear one was very effective with me because when i was playing through that section it, it was it was the first time i was like i could probably get around that dog if i wanted to but right. i'm just not going to and so like i really felt like i had to own that decision of killing that dog when i could have mm. Could have survived. Yeah, and this is another layer. Alice, where... I, I had no. That was not me. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> it wasn't no one's me. It was you. Naughty Dog. <laughs> yeah. uh, they are the monsters. It's another example, I think, of a really smart choice from Naughty Dog overall to have the names. You know, we were joking about everybody yelling out so many names throughout the LA section, but obviously it connects you more in the moment. And then now, like going through the WLF station and seeing all those names up there, you can connect so many back to that first half of the game. Such a cool idea. Even names of the dogs are important here. It's just how mm. often is it that dozens and dozens of NPC names are actually important other than, I guess, Peace Walker and Portable Ops. Anyways, uh, yeah. Sean Mills <laughs> writes in and says, what are your impressions of Isaac from this section? We hear a lot about him from other characters and can see he is an organized leader from the way the camp is set up, but it was terrifying to meet him in the middle of torturing a Seraphite. From the brief time you spend with him, you can tell he's an imposing figure who would do anything to protect his people. Isaac, thoughts? Uh, I think, like, speaking to what I was talking about earlier about it being militaristic, there's also, like, this strain of, like, you know, these are the harsh things we have to do to get by, but it kind of, like, 
skates by that stuff by saying like, oh, b- both times that uh, torture is employed in this game, which is when Ellie uh, tortures Nora and when Isaac tortures somebody, uh, it-, it definitely feels like, well, that's just that- that's just a thing you have to do in this like wild and crazy world that we that we live in. So it definitely feels like it is kind of showing that is like, oh man, this world is really brutal, but it doesn't really like like it doesn't really confront those things it's like do those things are those things necessary in this world it just kind of takes mm-hmm. that kind of stuff for granted but i don't know i don't know if it's supposed to make you hate isaac though i think it is i mean it seems like the tone immediately when you see isaac is this guy has gone too far i mean the music is as menacing and low as it can be and then even just like you know that torture scene he's like don't let him fall asleep and then later on yeah. it's him like eating that apple i feel like they're really yep. making it clear this guy's a piece of work yeah, he needs apples. Being the, <laughs> oh yeah, you don't the, need apples, the dude. Villain trope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's got to do something. He can't. He can't be seen petting a dog, right? He's got to be seen mowing down on an apple instead. <laughs> on an apple, on yeah. that that Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. The greatest villains of all time. Um, Are there Adam and Eve apples? Like, hmm. is there a brand? Does they, <laughs> do they capitalize on? Yeah. Adam and Eve, the, or, or the do they just like lean into it and call it like the forbidden fruit? Or yeah, I imagine like there's some like, you know, hipster brand of apples that calls themselves like Eve apples or something. Listen, I remember hearing at some point that like apples don't even grow in Mesopotamia. Like it would have been a kumquat. It would have been a kumquat. <laughs> that's it. Um, uh, I liked, uh, not liked, but I thought this section was interesting for seeing all those people in cages as well. Like on the way to mm. Isaac's office just like these people just like completely shattered and it's like it's not like mm-hmm. they're sh- shoving it in your face again it's just one of those things that if you really stop as abby and look and just have that moment of oh wait a minute wlf are pretty effed up over here mm-hmm. but the burritos yeah. no slouch uh mm-hmm. then we have another flashback three years earlier this is owen and abby uh on the ferris wheel um Patrick Henderson says, not going to lie, I took to Abby instantly. I prefer Abby's story arc, like her weapons better, etc. The acting between Abby and Owen's characters have also been top-notch. Uh, yeah, this is also one of those scenes where it started to sink in how much I actually like Owen, which I never would have thought of from that first section where we're seeing him a little bit. Um, thoughts on this section overall? Is this is this the because i feel like there's what two or three museum flashbacks or aquarium flashbacks is this the one where you're shooting the targets uh no no, that's later on so this is the first time through the museum where you come up in that little cool bubble area stuff like that and then she's like uh i don't want to kiss right now um but the, the art design for that aquarium is just unbelievable like just that alone and just the tiles and the way the light glimmers off the blue tiles on the wall i love that space so much i think it's amazing Mm -hmm. yeah i actually um in this section i had another instance of uh that has happened a couple of times where i was like oh i don't want to do this because abby wouldn't want to do this where uh uh, i believe owen was looking down uh, the elevator shaft so then i walked up close i walked up like right behind him and i was like oh abby wouldn't want to look down so i'd back off and then not do anything and then lo and behold i was supposed to walk up just close enough so that abby would be like oh i don't want to do that oh interesting Um, so yeah i was like spending like five to seven minutes just like well how do i get out of here and then i decided well wait what if i did and then so that's the problem for doing your performative uh playthrough the last of us part two is you're you're rping too hard i think overall too hard i can't do it i just i can't stop I liked all the um, drawings from the Max kid. And like, there's that great moment where Abby's like, I'd like to meet this kid. And then Owen says, he's a scar. Maybe I have. Like, I just, I love that idea of like, hey, you might have effing killed this kid, Abby. Who knows? Mm. But it's very Edith Finch. Uh, the last deepest dive we did is just to have <laughs> all those drawings to try and piece together what's going on here. And then the kid just disappeared. Um, yeah. And I, I liked that at one point, Owen... Owen basically calls out the fireflies and was like, basically we were terrorists. Like we were, we were blowing up checkpoints and stuff. And, yep. and you know, Abby's like, yeah, just don't say that around the other guys. Yeah. You know? But, but just like that, that acknowledgement from him kind of helps humanize at least his character and, and understanding that there are people within this organization that recognize the problems with it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of, I think there's a lot of like, gray area in 
all of the characters so far where I'm like, I don't feel like anybody is, yeah, good or uh, like inherently bad. Maybe Isaac, I don't know. But, um, but like it's felt like, oh yeah, everything is gray. There's just like, I can't, I can't be like, oh yes, you are clearly the shining knight in this uh, dim world. But then like, oh, you also like just like tortured somebody or you killed someone or yeah. whatever. You got to look to the cards to figure out who on the spectrum is yeah, all the way good. Be, uh, and that's very clear for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nick Olson says, one little moment of attention to detail that I loved in his section when Abby and Owen are on the Ferris wheel. When Abby jumps off and dives underwater, even though it's a cutscene, the breath meter shows up for a brief second. This also happens in the first game when Joel falls from the elevator shaft. And I just love that the narrative and gameplay are so interwoven. Uh, yes, that's very fun. It reminds me of like the opening of uh phantom pain when you're in the hospital and it's playing like the low health sound from mm. first metal Solid, even like during the cutscenes and stuff i believe so memory at least also i thought of phantom pain again in this section when mel and abby are in the back of that jeep and it's rolling and it's like oh this is like a uh, skull face is that his name god it's been yeah. a while since i've thought about it skull face and uh punish snake oh I, very I different of, uh, scenario uh, skyrim. Yeah. <laughs> wait skyrim yeah, oh, I, in the cart? I was like, oh, look, this is Skyrim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure somebody has already done that transition. Um, yep. Let's see. Uh, now we're back to going through the Chinatown area. You're being reminded that everybody in Seattle loves safes. Can't get enough of these mm-hmm. safes. They put them everywhere. Specifically safe that have like the clicky lock and not. No yep. one uses a pi- uh, like a dial pad that which would completely negate that mini game. Yep. Yep. It's got to <laughs> be there. Uh, Patrick O'Connor says, I think the notes in relation to the Seraphite's prophet do an excellent job fleshing out a story that I think we all assumed would be a major plot point. As Ellie, you can find a note where a survivor mentions meeting this healer woman who gave them comfort and care. The notes in Abby's section reveal that the prophet was simply someone attempting to live off the land rather than technology and that the WLF martyred her, resulting in the present conflict. Not only does it serve to upend the expectations you have after all the imposing iconography, it also serves the overall commentary of the cycle of violence and the need for empathy. Uh, Yeah, I thought that was really interesting where you find that truck and then all of those notes and abby's like this is a nice thing about abby being alone is her just being like you know the truth is dead but you keep coming back here and she's reading notes and she's like she's not a genie dude commenting on like people just asking for these requests but i think that is an interesting uh twist overall that idea of you know and lev gets to it a little bit later about this martyr is she just go back to the things she was writing and it wasn't as extreme and this extreme version of the scars are a result of the conflict and people kind of twisting her words throughout time here Mm -hmm. um yeah and there she even kind of blames isaac as well abby says like isaac you turned a crazy person into a martyr here um do you it's also interesting to me like the i'm curious how much they thought about it or wanted to make sure they were very distinct about it but there's like flavors of like uh native american touchstones with the scars you know maybe it's just as simple as things like lev will describe areas in a different way being like oh instead of talking about this river at this quadrant of the street they're like oh it starts at the rushing water there's like it's always kind of dancing around those like classic native american tropes from other media and stuff like that i'm sure they wanted to make sure they were quite a bit distinct uh this section as well um had an area gameplay wise that kicked my ass which was the slanted building, like the fight in the big multi-story slanted building. Do you all remember this one? Did you have trouble with it as well? Is it the one towards... Was it that entire section or was it like towards the end? Uh, It was, I guess, towards the end. Well, hang on. Now I'm second guessing it. Maybe there are... I think there might be multiple slanted buildings that I'm thinking of. Uh, But I haven't been safe scumming this section comments were totally right that is not the way to play this game and so <laughs> i've been rolling with it but I've, I've been getting my ass kicked quite a bit uh and this is also an area then where they bring back the big hammer people uh the, oh, yeah yes. like people who are 10 percent larger than other people are suddenly now like almost immune to your attacks and because yeah. they will get an axe and yeah that is like a weird thing where it's like yeah they're not gonna make them like the armored dudes that they are in every yeah. other third person yeah here. but it does feel weird that it's like this person is slightly bigger so we're gonna have to deal with them completely different it's a slightly yeah. different thing you need so, to bomb at them uh we actually uh, so in the the audience that i was with 
my brother. Uh, it, me and him, well, actually, me and everybody uh, were arguing, is it an axe or is it a hammer? And then my brother looked it up, and then he was like, oh, this is clearly a hammer. This is a hammer that you use at a, uh, what you call it, like a train yard where you're putting in uh, things like that. Yeah. But like, no one is using that as a hammer, and they're using it as an axe. So we still don't know exactly if this is an axe or a hammer. <laughs> it's the fusion. Looking. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's why I was like, oh, this is a sledge axe, clearly. Mm. Because it's a, it is that. So that's why I want to formally put that these are all now sledge axes. Okay. And you're uh, submitting and that for the record, Charles. For the record, yeah. Okay. All right, that. man. Wait till you play this next section. <laughs> <laughs> uh Eric Anderson says, I played through this part with a completely different play style than I had with Ellie. This is kind of getting back to what you were saying, Serial. And while with Ellie, I took my time as Abby, I was so desperate to see the end that I really started to be more aggressive with my play style and rushed through the environments more. Um, Tim Laro says, I'm a fan of Abby's loadout. Is it it is similar to Ellie, but it has enough differences that makes this section feel fresh again. The Hunter pistol is so intense to use since it's pretty powerful when it hits, but is punishing with its long reload time. Also, the introduction of the shiv mechanic from the last game adds more complexity and intensity to melee combat. My favorite detail is that if you can't find a crossbow bolt, you will likely see it broken on the floor. Oh, wow. I didn't even notice that. That's crazy. Um, yeah, Abby's loadout is just awesome like the shotgun's awesome the flamethrower you get later is awesome mainly just because yeah. i love the thing um but then even just okay let's give her all the great stuff here's incendiary shells for the shotgun then she can craft them let's just go nuts with her abilities here yeah, yeah. and the i like that you can upgrade the hunter's pistol with the magnifying or with the scope on it which is a real mm. game changer um and and also the crossbow is what I wanted the Ellie's bow to be. Because when, when I first got the bow for Ellie, I was like, oh, all right, I've been waiting for this. This is going to be awesome. And then it, it's just like you really have to upgrade it a bunch in order to, to just kind of make it worth your time. Yeah. But this is this is the one where it's like, yes, if you hit someone with a crossbow bolt or an arrow, you should be able to get it back like 90% of the time. Like none of this, mm -hmm. it has to be a headshot and then right. sometimes you'll maybe be able to get a freaking arrow back. It's I'm just going to use the silenced pistol at that point, but the crossbow ugh. It's it's really <laughs> uh, I haven't actually used the hunter's pistol, so What? Might, uh, yeah, I know. I, I was like oh, this crossbow is amazing and that's all I used, where I was just like for the the longest time, I was just like, okay, getting headshots. Oh, I can pick it up. Oh, I got headshots. Oh, I can keep on picking it up. Uh, and then eventually, I ran out of stuff, and I was like, oh crap! Now I have to use like a shotgun. It wasn't until, but I did get the the incendiary shotguns, which uh, is awesome. It, are those uh dumb question? Are those like real? Are there incendiary shotgun shells in real life? I feel like they exist. Okay, someone someone probably dreamt that up right i don't know yeah I, I, it seems that they wouldn't include it if it's not but um yeah I, that same thing i think charles where i had i got that hunter's pistol and like i already have a pistol i've been upgrading it i'm fine i don't need it and then i, I switched to it and it was like in mcgruber when he uses a gun for the first time because like i think it was on the boat like i shot the first person was like boosh i just went like flying back i was like this tiny thing it's like the noisy cricket i had no idea <laughs> that it was an option here it's just absurd Okay. Uh, Carl Greenier is annoyed about having to restart the skill tree progression with Abby. Um, I don't know if I really am too impacted about it personally, just because it feels like I'm rarely excited about those skill tree upgrades to begin with. So it's not a matter of like, oh, I feel like I'm a piece of crap again. It all is just kind of mad to me. I, I did definitely miss like um, faster prone. I think that was like the one that I mm. really wanted. But I think, yeah, I started specking towards stealth because that was like my natural inclination. But then because I think I started just like kind of like abandoning stealth towards the end, I was just, oh, I feel I feel I wish you could respect a little bit because then I would have gone back and just gotten like immediately like the incendiary shotgun shells and just all the all the let me just kill dudes better uh, skills because like, yeah, at this point, I'm not really sneaking much. Um, but besides that one thing, I don't know that I necessarily missed a ton of like the upgrades because they don't feel like um completely crucial to like none of them necessarily change the way you place super much but yeah um yeah i wish we, uh, proning faster is the only thing that i really liked do you think somebody online has made the respect parody of respect the song 
Or they go, R-E-S-P-E-C. <laughs> Naughty dog, let us do that. Something like that. Yeah, that yeah, right. that sounds exactly how it should be. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I noticed in this section too, uh, checkpoints are much more spaced out. They're still not egregious, but compared to Ellie, where it almost seemed like after every kill there was a checkpoint. I had a lot of situations here where I was like, whoa, I'm I'm going back to the beginning of this encounter. Okay. I don't know if anybody else noticed that. Uh, I think I think I might have noticed it more just when I was still trying to stealth because they would be like those were the only times where I saw like a checkpoint that said like one minute instead of less than one minute. Okay, yeah. Uh there was there might have been a time I remember vaguely that it had it said three minutes, but like for the most part I always felt like Every encounter feels like it's checkpointed before and after. Um, so as, as long as you get through an area, I think you're usually good with a checkpoint. But I don't know. Sure. Sean GZ Do It Easy. <laughs> oh, boy. Says, I just want to say that when you clear out an area as Abby, and then every now and then she will say, well, that's the last of them i can't help but chuckle a little bit uh it's a great touch of the game being pretty self-aware to the player it's almost like when a character utters the title of the tv show movie they're in uh yeah i did notice that it's so tough i'm sure for the devs to like avoid that but it stands out to me in every game now even like in days gone when our boy deacon st john's like well that's the last of them it's like, yeah it's, it immediately <laughs> takes you out of it and makes you think of this thing. Well, it's like it's like such a common phrase for that situation that yeah. It, yeah well, like like how are you supposed to write around it and not make a ref like what sounds like a reference? I think yeah. that's There's I think no that's more it. of them. <laughs> <laughs> they oh, are yeah. over. I mean, yeah, those days are gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been waiting for something and it hasn't happened yet, but. I am obsessed with this. I know I've talked about it before, but I remember an interview with Sean Vanneman, who was the co-lead on The Walking Dead season one. And he said that the mission for that writing team was, we're not going to use the phrase, how you holding up. Uh, and then after I heard that, I went and played The Last of Us part one. And in that, they say, how you holding up like three times or something throughout that game. And they have not done it in The Last of Us part two. So I don't know if they're aware of this cliche now, or maybe they heard Vanneman's slight criticism <laughs> yeah, no. of that phrase and took it to heart or what uh darkfish days um says one animation that i've meant to comment about is the lunge to the ground for both ellie or abby they can go from a full run immediately to prone which causes the character to hit the ground hard and slide i think it's even more distinct in wet and muddy areas i should note that i don't use listen mode so sometimes i've been running through a combat area thinking no one is around and suddenly i spot an enemy and have to fall into tall grass i love how that painful looking thud reflects the panic i feel in the moment Good detail, man. Uh, That's actually something that uh, I noticed is that I didn't use listening mode uh, throughout the first part of the game. And then it wasn't until halfway through this section where I was like, oh, I'll try listening mode. And I upgraded it because I had to upgrade oh, it for uh, something. I was like, oh, this is what listening mode is uh, used for. <laughs> it's very helpful. I don't know if I'm just up in my head, but it feels like is Ellie's better. I can't quite get a read on it. But there's something interesting, too, about... I I was playing Ellie more stealthy and I felt more like a hunter as Ellie, which is weird because Ellie was acting more like a literal wolf than the wolf is in this game where it's like, she's more, I treat her place out more like a gorilla of just running up and just beating the crap out of people instead of like slowly stalking them through the grass like Ellie was. Mm. Um, Mark Miller has another detail here saying, um, a detail that amazed me from this section was when I jumped by a walker and fought him off and Abby not having the shiv makes her so much more physical. She punches it back and slams its head against the wall and the body slides down the wall. The amazing detail is the blood splatter of the head on the wall and then the streak where the body slid down. It is so perfect I felt like I could come through the area later and recreate the scene of exactly how the fight went down. I happen to be playing through Return of the Obra Dinn which really helped highlight the detail here as well. <laughs> yes, that would be helpful. I'm a... I love... Uh, seeing Abby's new animations compared to Ellie's of like getting infected in that chokehold or like a human player in the chokehold with huge muscles just cracking them. Um, but it is crazy that in this game we haven't seen anybody get infected yet. They are getting so close to these things' mouths all the time. <laughs> just like putting them in some chokeholds, just swinging away at them with their fists. It's like if they just nick that thing's tooth, won't they get infected? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Do you think I'm we're going to see an infection maybe. in this game? It seems odd that it hasn't happened yet, right? I mean, Nora. Oh, I guess so. Yeah. 
That was just like labored breathing. Not a yeah. classic ass infection. Just label, yeah, you know. Yeah, anybody could get away from that. <laughs> um, okay, back to the story. Where are we at here? So another flashback. Uh, oh, so after this... Okay, so before this flashback, uh, she gets tackled by the, the big lady and bites her ear off, but then Clonk gets... What was the name of the weapon again? Uh, sledge Axe. Sledge Axe to the face. Then yep. uh, another flashback four months earlier. Um, so this is the other one with uh, Abby and Owen, and this is the one where they're in the aquarium, and it's Christmas time. And it's my favorite thing, but there's Christmas music playing in the aquarium, and I didn't recognize it. So did the composers create original Naughty Dog Christmas music? I think that's what's going on there. I'd love to know. Great question. Uh, if you know if that, that was licensed question. or something, let me know. Because it sounded like original Naughty Dog Christmas music. Um, <laughs> but this is then that part you're talking about, Charles, where they're shooting the bow and you get to do that, yeah. the, the practice stuff. Which How did everybody do at that part? I beat the high score. Oh, yeah. Pretty good. Same. I think I ended up matching Owens because I couldn't just... I, I, it didn't take me very long, but I couldn't find the last target. So I just spent yeah. like most of that one run like, I don't know where the last target is. And I ended up tying Owen, which I feel okay with. But yeah. next time. Yeah. <laughs> next time. Uh, I think I barely <laughs> got it. And I love... It's one of the most human details so far in the game. And I just loved it. But I love that moment of Owen... Just like the awkward beat where Owen doesn't put the high score on the board. And Abby's just like, why aren't you doing... Oh, you don't want Mel to know I was here? He's like, oh, no, it's not that. And it's like this jokey dynamic that has just so much underneath it of like, yeah, of course, that's exactly what it is. And then he's like, oh, no. Mm. Okay, I'll do it. No problem here. I'm not scared of my girlfriend knowing that I have an ex-girlfriend that I occasionally hang out with. Um, yeah. I thought that was a really uh, interesting moment overall. Um, and then there's kind of that more of joking with so much more depth after that where they have that discussion where oh at some point owen says you don't deserve one and then abby's like are you talking about stalking or talking about somebody who loves me uh and it's another one of those like oh just those subtle quick little moments that's like okay abby has got me hooked on her as a character it's again painting her more in that sympathetic rejected light but it's like oof oof so perfect um and then owen talks about the rumors of fireflies regrouping in santa barbara do we think that's going to be the end of the game? Is somebody taking a boat to Santa Barbara for this Firefly reunion? That has to be a thing, right? I mean, in order to accurately recreate the main menu, we mm. have to go inside of some type of large body of water that is calm. So, oh, maybe. like the Pacific Ocean. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, now we are back to real time but not ellie's real time abby's real time and it picks up where that trailer picked up years ago which yeah. playing through this section it is so mind-boggling that this was one of the well, early to mid trailers for the last of us part two was showing this slice like that is a bold move naughty dog it wasn't that wasn't that the first one no there was the one of no, the joel where he was dead like leaning in the oh, watching Ellie play mm. and stuff, but it might have been the second. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I, yeah it was definitely like one of the earlier bits, and it mm. does seem like it, it. It still seems like a really weird move on their part because it's like without the context of knowing who Abby was or any of the characters involved there, it just felt like this weird, like, oh yeah, this, this game is basically like hostile dude. Like it felt like this really like, <laughs> come on, dude. It, it, it felt like, like, yeah, it felt like violence porn where it's just like, we're going to show you how brutal we are this time around by like, you know, I mean, I, I mutilating think, one of our characters that you don't even know. So it just feels like this violence out of context. That is how it was read for sure. And I think that's totally fair, but I mean, I don't think that's where they were coming from was, Come on, dude, check out this gore. I mean, I think they were coming from, wouldn't it be crazy if we showed this slice just to get people speculating about where this game is going and what this game ultimately is, while at the same time not really telling them anything? Uh, don't you think? Yeah, I think, I, I think part of like the loss of context was intentional on their part because, like, hey, we don't want to spoil anything. But I think like the way it came off was just like this weird, yeah. like, oh, oh like, our game is all about how violent it is, which is kind of a weird pitch like sure. e even if they didn't intend it that way that's definitely how it came off sure. i remember watching that live 
and watching the chat try to figure out if it was Days Gone or The Last of Us Part 2. <laughs> and I'm sure um, Naughty Dog were jumping out of windows at that point, like looking at the fidelity of that game, like, you think this is Days Gone? What have we been slaving over? Uh, Colin Rothermel says, it takes a lot to outdo all the tense, invigorating moments we've already played through, but Abby almost gets hanged running through the dark forest with infected coming out of every corner or standoff to finish it off. Also, you get a rematch with the big lady, and it was awesome, even though she looked like the principal from Matilda. Yeah. <laughs> It's perfect. Um, I love that moment too, where it's like, oh, is Abby just getting metroided here? Or what's going on? And then she has that moment of like, are you wearing my backpack? And it's like, oh, that's such a smart way to immediately just get all your stuff back. But yeah, I was amazed that I think only Colin wrote in talking about that sequence because I thought that was incredible of running through the woods yeah. and like mm -hmm. just the pitch perfect amount of just seeing a glimpse of an infected off to the side. It's like, oh my God, if I stopped and look around, they could be everywhere. It was so cool. Yeah, I really, really loved that part. Uh, there, there's a part where uh, you're trying to get them both through the door. And, and you, cause like they're, you, the door's locked and you're trying to walk, like basically like leapfrogging them over. And I knew the second that uh, she went to like give the the second person a step. It's like, yeah. oh, she's not getting out of here. Like that door is gonna lock behind them, and you're gonna be. This is gonna be what this section is. Right. And I don't know why I predicted that based on just like the camera angle kind of going in. But I, I like the second that she's like, oh, I'll help you out too. It's like, no, they're gone. They're like, they're not gonna come back for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tyler Carver says Abby is an amazing character. I truly love how they're telling the story from two different perspectives. But I find it odd how quickly she takes on the two Seraphite siblings. The game makes it seem like she has the deep-rooted grudge against the Seraphite based off her orders as a WLF and the Seraphite's killing her squad mates. Yet these two kids come along and save her life and it's just, nah, hey, they're not so bad. I, I also was struck by how quickly that pivot happened or how open she was to like helping the siblings out here. But I think what really helped lock it in later is she had some reference to how it's a nice way for her to kind of relieve her inner guilt over Joel's death. Just to further cement that idea that she's, you know, she's not comfortable with what she did and what we had to look at either. You know, it's, it's been agonizing her and this is her way of kind of putting that at rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I guess I didn't have any problems with it because at, you know, at first it's born out of the fact that they saved her life and totally didn't have to. And then that immediately transitioned to them running for their lives and her relying on them, on them to get her out of that situation until right. the point where they were at a place which she effectively abandons them at that point. And it takes her a night of kind of sleeping on it to think like, ah, oh, well, you know, like I should, I should go back and check on those people. And so yeah. I, yeah. I think there was enough time there and there was enough nuance there that it didn't, it didn't stand out too much for me it reminded me a little bit too of that i should go back and check on them just because i'm obsessed with no country for old men because i remember visiting naughty dog for the cover story trip for the first game i remember that was a huge reference point is uh neil and bruce talked about how they wanted to make the video game version of no country for old men but that section reminded me so much of like uh when lil moss is like in the trailer and then he gets up in the middle of the night and gets the jug of water and goes back out to the shootout scene to, to give it to the Mexican Mexican guy who's like dying in the truck. And then that's what causes everything. It's just that moment of guilt of like, I got to go back for him. I can't just live here and know that there's these troubled people out there. Um, but this is where you start to fight uh, with Lev overall. Um, I loved, I don't know if it happened for you guys and when it happened, but I love there's an awesome moment where I just happened to make an, a sweet kill where I put the silencer on my pistol, took out an infected, and then Lev just goes, wow. Like, and it was so <laughs> nice to like immediately connect me to Lev that like, yeah, he noticed that I'm a huge badass as well. I thought that was a very cool move, but did you get that? Does anybody remember that wow moment? I did not get that. No. I didn't there were, that. there were a couple, a couple, like a string of headshots that I got at some point where he, he was kind of making comments about them and okay. he seemed genuinely okay. impressed. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. Um, and then, you know, it, you know, like you were talking about Serial, I knew that there was a thing coming up when Abby at some point goes, well, it should be a straight shot from here. And then, of course, you fall and collapse and go into the water and then get up on the ferry, which I thought was such a cool place to fight as well, just because I love Seattle's ferries, even though it feels like a little mini Resident Evil revelations up there. But I think it was really cool. 
Yeah, it was weird because like this felt like the the game almost acknowledging its own like kind of tropes because like you're the, the way that happens is like you're in that in this really tall part of the thing which they're like oh how come we never noticed this before oh they're just really high and seattle's really foggy mm. uh and so you're you're going up there and you yeah you you they're like hey once we cross over here we'll be totally fine and you just happen to fall off and it's like that air, that area just happens to be contaminated with like you know a bunch of walkers and it's like one of the, i think it's the second time you i think it's the first time you encounter stalkers as abby right yeah but you're thinking of the spot later on. This is still yeah. earlier. Oh, is this like near the... You're where, thinking like, of all stuff the in the second day when they fall off. Yeah, so this is the area in the boat uh, when you're on your way to get the goods at the hospital. Oh, okay. Back. Yeah, all yeah. Right. No. But no, we can definitely get to that spot later a little bit here. So she makes her way back to... Uh, or makes her way... No, I'm sorry. Not going, trying to get the goods from the hospital. That's what you're trying to do in day two. I'm sorry. For this one, she's just trying to get to the boat. Uh-huh. And then that was that amazing moment of she finally gets to the boat, opens up the boat where Owen's supposed to be. And then it's like this awesome long shot of like Abby blocking the entrance to the boat. So you can't see what's happening with Owen in this boat. And then the camera just like slowly moves. And then you see that it's just Owen looking dejected and him having a really interesting heartfelt speech about like, why are we, why are we here? Why are we why fighting are we over this here? land uh, that I don't care at all about? Um, and then, you know, tensions build. He has some line about, you know, asking Abby sarcastically, like, oh, how do you grow up now? I, I go and torture people that killed my family. Like, everybody's got some murdered family members. Is this the way you do it, Abby? Um, and then it pivots. Um, and yep. there is a sex scene in The Last of Us Part Two. Uh, Jeff, um, gut reaction to the sex scene? Uh, it was me kind of looking at my wife and my wife looking at me like what the hell <laughs> that, <laughs> that went places i was not not expecting um and i i guess you know like i at when it started i cringed because it was like okay like what we need you know like we need this forced romance scene that like I, I guess like that that's always the thing i care least about in like post-apocalyptic movies where everyone is almost dying is like who's going to have a romance with who and whatever. Uh-huh. Um, but they, they certainly didn't portray it as like a super romantic thing or anything. Right. That's the crazy thing. Somebody wrote in, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get their name, but they're like, that sex scene wasn't titillating at all. Come on. And it's like, yeah, I don't think the point was for it to be a titillating sex scene. It was just supposed to yeah. reveal kind of uh, their relationship a little bit more kind of the, you know, Abby's nature a little bit more. I, I think it was, interesting i was really excited when it started going like oh my god i'm so happy this is in a video game not again not on a, a creepy titillating way but like i'm so happy this is happening just a matter of like i love that idea that for a video game the developers had to sit down and talk about like okay um how should this sex scene go what type of sex was this relationship all about you know and just having those discussions in a studio i think is a really cool sign of the game industry maturing but charles i'm very curious you with your uh the theater that you were playing this game for what the reaction yes. was like uh the reaction was like uh what is this game rated that was that was the okay. initial reaction i was like really throughout everything that we have just done this is the the thing that you're gonna bring up there was um, a nipple though so i mean yes that's true it's outrageous. So, well rated rated ao there you go a- Never mind. <laughs> no jokes needed uh surreal did you have thoughts on this uh yeah if it, well obviously it's not framed to be romantic i think it's yeah. very much speaking to like you know this was this was a. Uh, like the sex is more out of desperation than like them. It feels like, like they're going to have a tough time, obviously talking about it with Mel, if they decide to do that. I don't, I don't think the story gets that far. Um, but it definitely was not going to, I don't think that from the beginning, I didn't think of it being framed as like, Oh, they're in love with each other. It was more like, like we're just like, we have, we need an outlet for all this stuff at some it's, point. And it's just, it, I mean, they make it so clear. It's so connected to aggression for them. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so Harrison Holt McHale says, I love Abby's design, her physique, her brutality, her strength. You can wail on infected and your bare fist really feel the impact this cemented itself in the forest when you and yara are rescued by lev abby in the rain with tons of muscle in the show uh the way she transforms this into quote i'm not going to die here machine is beautiful 
It can't all be sunshine and roses, though. That sex scene is bad. I'm so angry at you, but it's actually passion. It's tropey. It's awkward. For a game that has some of the best moment-to-moment storytelling in the medium, this was a definite low point. Also, F. Owen for cheating on his pregnant girlfriend. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm that quick pivot. I was trying to think of like, God, what does it remind me of? And just like we talked about in the last episode, it reminds me of Brokeback Mountain where they're, they're fighting mm-hmm. each other. And then that quick pivot happens. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've never had anything like that happen to me, so I don't know how realistic it is. I've never, <laughs> I've never gone, I've never swung back that quickly on anyone, but hmm. uh, it, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't have like a, like a good thesis for w- whether or not it's fine. Like it seemed fine. I don't know. It didn't sure. seem like a, I, I mean that, that pivot is a trope in itself that happens all the time of like these two characters are angry at each other and then mm-hmm. they start making out. And then yep. yeah, I guess, I guess I appreciate that when it turned into a sex scene, it was an, it was not a standard kind of sex scene. Like it, sure. like it kept going with, with that kind of like anger and awkwardness. It turned it didn't turn into Terminator one slow, yeah. <laughs> sexy theme. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just one of those nice things, you know, and I think last of us says this in a couple spots, but it's one of those moments of, Oh, have I ever, my playable character in a video game ever been the cause of, another relationship's infidelity before i'm sure something in dragon age or something i have never played dragon age but i mean can anybody think of an example please leave an example in the comments if you can think of being the cause yeah, I, of infidelity i just don't think you see a lot of like pre-ordained relationships in games explored right in period. it's usually like they want to give you that choice so it's always like hey here's your relationship with this person that you've chosen and so you just give them gifts and eventually you have sex with them like that's relationships in most games and so, like, you don't really, you, you couldn't even try to explore something like that because you don't, there aren't a lot of set relationships in games. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then we're in Seattle Day 2. Um, there's a scene that, it was so quick, but I just loved it for just the quick intensity of it where Lev does not like dogs and he had, like, the bow up ready to shoot Alice and Alice is barking and it's just this quick scene of everybody going to a 10 on the like tension meter about like put that bow down put that bow down Alice stop barking it's just like this amazing yeah. beautiful quick climax that's quickly resolved but oh I thought it was so cool um, <laughs> and then this was that moment where I realized like oh Yara is oh. going to have that surgery because even in the last discussion I think I mentioned that you know, what was all that surgery stuff doing in the mm-hmm. aquarium and then like okay mm-hmm. now it's fun that you would get to see that connection if you were paying attention there um oh and another moment where i really liked owen's delivery and and dialogue in general where uh i think he was worried about mel and then abby had some had some line about like i don't care about last night and then owen's like well i do like i thought it was a very sweet interesting dynamic for that relationship there with that one um Mm -hmm. anyways matthew steen He's getting to the heart of it, saying, Abby bonding with Lev really gave me Joel and Ellie first meeting vibes. It makes me wonder if we hadn't been given Joel's tragic introduction with his daughter dying in the first game, how long would it have taken for us to warm up to him? Introducing Joel through a compassionate lens versus introducing Abby through a despicable lens greatly impacts our impressions of playing these characters, even though they're seemingly going through a similar journey. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yes, the bonding with Lev stuff. I mean, they do so many fun little things. I've just it's fish out of water stuff, but it's always fun, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah, it's I guess basically Terminator Two again, where <laughs> Lev like says it, you know, cold instead of cool and stuff like cool, that. Yeah. Or just being confused about the dancing cats mural. What is going on in this? Or even mm-hmm. when Lev gets the flashlight and like shines it into his face instead of like shining it in the house and it's like whoa it's like the stupid klutzy nature every once in a while it's super fun to to watch evolve here um sarah morgan says lev is the mvp of the game he has truly powerful moments of wisdom and absolute fearlessness for a 13 year old juxtaposed juxtapositioned against a hardened soldier like abby quote just think about the good parts to fear you run faster, you're more focused, you don't feel pain as much, every bad feeling, your palms sweating, your heart racing, they're all signs you're actually stronger. So when you feel afraid, you should think about how your body is getting for ready for what's coming. Only when weak may I carry my true strength. This mentality he has plays so much into his development as a character, Abby and Lev are the perfect pair to learn from one another. One another. I thought that was a really interesting moment too, another moment where mm-hmm. Lev like stepped up a notch. Uh, 
on my respect level like oh that's a really interesting line and then being yeah. like oh did that come from uh the scripture and he's like yeah it's in the scripture it's good stuff turns out it's not all just insane martyrdom i right. feel like i read that line completely differently it's just like I, I read it as like someone who doesn't know how to comfort people trying to comfort someone it, with mm. like facts about well if you think about it you know your heart rate is actually you know it's good for your circulation when you're afraid and are about to be killed so you don't think abby took solace in that I think I, I think that she like because I, I was waiting for a line from her. I was like, oh, OK, uh, but she doesn't. So it, it does feel like she took solace from it. But like I read it as like if someone were to say that to me, it'd be like, OK, but also I'm about to die and I'm afraid. So, yeah, I don't care that like I'm stronger or whatever as I'm running around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John Ford says I was just as slow as Abby at figuring out Lev's story. Wait are they doing this all because you cut your hair? The rules are so strict. Wow. Scars calling out during the sky bridge sequence. Lily. I said, wait, what? An hour later. Oh, oh damn. Being chased out of a religious extremist community for being trans is just so current and important without feeling forced. Uh, and then Doreen replied to that comment and said, as a trans person, I just want to add that for me personally, not speaking for any other trans folks, of course, Love's inclusion felt timely, important, and very well written. I shrieked with excitement because I knew immediately what was happening. Um, yeah, what did you all think about that scene where they're screaming out uh, his dead name, Lily? Uh, it felt like really well handled. It felt like uh, subtle enough to the point where they weren't, yeah, it was not like beating you over the head and like, oh, yeah. clearly this is, uh, this is our stance and, or, or whatnot. And it was, uh, and I really did appreciate that where I was, uh, I was also in that same camp. I was like, oh, it's weird that you're like exiled from cutting your hair off. And I was like, oh, oh. And then as that kept going, it was like a, it was a cool revelation uh, to one, just to like figure that out. But then, to have it not be like super up in your face about it uh, or like, yeah. And I think like shoving it down your throat. And I wish I went in as pure as you did. Cause I knew like, I think the actor was on stage a while ago. And so I knew there was a trans character in the last of us part two. And so I didn't have that moment of being confused. Like a lot of people did, but amazing thing is, you know, somebody even replied to one of the comments like, Oh, is that what was going on there? Like it's the sign that that storyline has been subtle up to this point. I hope it, you know, is as subtle going throughout the rest of it. I think it's really beautifully subtle, but that some players could not even fully pick up on what was going on there. Like there's that exchange between Abby and Lev uh, where Lev says, did you hear what they called me? Like, yeah. Want to ask me about it? Do you want me to ask you about it? No. Okay. Like I love yeah. just how quick and like good Abby was just like, yeah, okay, no problems here. Let's just keep on moving. Um, yeah. And, Th that part for me felt a little bit on the nose, but it was mm. because like you, I was coming into it having already heard that this was part of the story. And so I right. already knew all of that. So I'm, I'm happy to hear these other comments and that it did play so well for other people who didn't know that going in. Yeah. And it's yeah. one of those things that's also just showing, I think the power of video games of, Oh, I've, uh, I'm not a trans person. I've never had that experience of being called, uh, my dead name in a video game like that has never happened and just to not saying that now I understand what all trans people are going through you know but just having that experience in a game and just showing things from your perspective and what you're seeing in this game it's just that little moment of like oh this is such an interesting vantage point that I've never seen in a video game before it really hit me hard uh, overall I mean it's it's one of my favorite moments of the year is just that little quick sequence I didn't expect it to hit me that hard but I think it was just so well done overall um, Jared Duddy says the moment I fell in love with Abby was during day two when her and Lev were going across a sky bridge Abby's vertigo was kicked into overdrive the howling wind was shaking the bridge and out of nowhere Lev, Lev asks so what's up with you and your friend Owen only for a terrified Abby to yell, oh my God, Lev, now? In an instant, <laughs> this moment made me go from being incredibly stressed out to laughing so hard I had to pause the game. Uh, yeah, I loved that fun flip that happened in the buildup mm -hmm. to this climbing sequence of Abby like looking after Lev and being like, okay, careful when you jump, you gotta be careful. And then it growing to the point of basically Lev like dragging Abby across <laughs> the skyscraper, you know? Yeah, yeah, I really like the part where... Uh like Abby thought, oh yeah, I did it. 
And then uh, Lev was like, oh, you're not going to like me after this. Part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. great. Uh, Andrew yeah. Holmes says, we'll make my way to the shortcut on day two. I stopped by a waterfall and walked up to the edge as Abby gets close to the edge of a large height. The camera pulls back and she begins to look uncomfortable and nervous due to her vertigo and issue with heights. The small touches are continuing to impress me. Uh, Ross Winyard says you can choose to go out of your way during the ascent of the Skybridge building. You end up on the end of a structure suspended in midair with some loot at the end and Abby shaking with her arms wrapped around her torso actually says to herself, why am I doing this? Small, missable, contextual and tied into the main plot of this part of the narrative, which is, I believe, to not only show Abby's compassion for Lev, but also to humanize her by showing fear and weakness in an otherwise unbelievably powerful character. Naughty Dog at its finest. Jerry Young, as someone who is afraid of heights, I haven't been more stressed at any point in this game than crossing the sky bridges with Lev. Clickers, shamblers, dark rooms I can handle, but Naughty Dog did such an amazing job of capturing, Ab- capturing Abby's fear, I felt like I was crossing that bridge. I don't like heights either, but I actually was a little bit disconnected during this section of just feeling like, oh, it's an interesting character detail, but I don't feel it in this game at all. I'm not scared at all, so it's a weird disconnect between me and Abby, who's basically turned into Luigi from Luigi's mansion trying to <laughs> walk across these things. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, because I, up until then I hadn't really considered that, that there's a balance mechanic in the game even to begin with. And this is like the first yeah. time it really calls attention to itself. So I basically disregard like when it said, Oh, you should move the left analog stick to balance. I just ignored it. Like it wasn't like I, there was no tension for me, the player when I was crossing that bridge, even though like, you know, some of those camera soups were making it, there was like a definitely like don't look down, don't look down kind of mentality to that scene because it is kind of the the, the camera is so up close on you. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I didn't necessarily feel feel it as much as others. There is a cool moment when like the clouds part though, or the fog parts, and it's like okay, now we can just see like, exactly oh. how high we are. But again, I don't think I don't think I was freaked out. Um, but I did think that moment was so incredibly well done when you fall and you fall into the pool for just like okay, you got to make this final stretch. And I genuinely thought that I had effed up. I was waiting for the game over screen to pop up. And it's like, oh, that's what was supposed to happen? Like, that's just incredible work on Naughty Dog's part to make that feel also natural, even though it was inevitable mm-hmm. there. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, or I did want to say that I feel like I was uh, role-playing more in that uh, scenario. Right. Because, like, me, personally, I also was not feeling, like, afraid. But I was feeling empathetic towards Abby, for her being afraid so then i was like okay don't look down uh i would not like abby would not look down i'm not gonna look down i'm gonna just like for uh, like focus forward and then just move forward and keep going um and so i i felt that and yeah the second that you fall i was like oh i screwed i screwed this up uh i i let you down abby and then yeah it was it was supposed to happen (laughs) Uh, yeah I, I had I had asked my wife to look at the screen uh, during that point because she kind of gets the heebie-jeebies whenever a vi- you know whenever a character's up high like it it always affects her um, and it it didn't when I was out in the middle of it and so she was like no that that's not really affecting me and then I kind of got closer to the building where there's kind of more of an overlap and she was like yeah okay that that's that's doing it for me oh so, wow a little bit there but. yeah. Uh, Beto's Burrito says I had a hilarious moment first crossing the sky bridge where Lev tries to encourage Abby to overcome her fears only for me to immediately mess up and have Abby fall off screaming to her doom I guess her fear of heights was completely rational after all sorry abs come on burrito uh, ENT Clark says when Abby is traveling with uh, Lev to the hospital there are several apartments you can pass through to get to one, you have to jump through the from the interstate onto a balcony. When you open the sliding glass door, there is a table that is completely set up for a D&D session for about six players and a dungeon master. That oh. was a fun house. You're right, Auntie Clark. Yeah. Um, God, I loved approaching the hospital and having that moment of like swimming up and they're like, trespasser, who's out there? And just, it's such a cool feeling. It feels like I had like the invincibility star from Mario. So I'm just that idea of like, well, now I can just walk right up to the situation and know that there's not going to be any problems. Of course, yeah. then eventually tensions brew up and stuff, but I just love that mm-hmm. liberating feeling. Um, Jason M. O'Brien says, I have so many thoughts, but the one that stood out to me was meeting Whitney, the Vita playing wolf, the Vita playing wolf Ellie killed. Talking to her about the game was fun and heartbreaking when remembering that I brutally killed her just hours before. I wish she knew that. Yeah, you you kind of go out, you go through a whole tour of all the people that you killed in that area. Yep, and yeah. they're all so and, nice. And it, 
it, it was it was also fun and it's it's kind of a that clever twist on like it's a very it, it used to be a very common development thing of like well we're going to make you go re go through this section in order to just kind of save having to create a new section uh-huh. but but like here it was like I was I was super excited to go through that area because I knew where everything was and I knew all these people and I was getting to see it from a vantage point at a time, you know, before all that stuff happened. And so, yeah, I still yeah. enjoyed it. Uh, Hunter S. Sachs says, two things that made this Metal Gear Solid 2 Switch work for me. I too have a fear of heights and that immediately endeared her to me. But more importantly and specifically is the walk up to the hospital. I literally started giggling and bouncing. Ellie is at most 20 minutes behind Abby the whole time. Just a few hours ago, I stealthed through this grass and took them all out one by one. Now I'm walking through the same exact layout and the exact same patrol patterns, and I realized, oh my god, they're all about to die. Uh, Mattress Monkey says, I really like how during Ellie's campaign, it always feels like Abby is either one step ahead of you or is at least aware of you being in Seattle. Then when you play as Abby, you realize that she has no idea Ellie's in Seattle and has her own completely separate problems and events going on. This really helps establish the connection to Abby since you almost forget that Ellie is out there hunting you down and you can focus completely on Abby's story. I love that. That's my favorite little moment in so many stories is just when one character is convinced that somebody else thinks something's a big deal and for the other character, it's like, what? This stupid mm. little girl. I don't know who she is. I don't care. I've got so many problems mm. of my own here. Um, Joshua Turner says, when playing as Ellie, did anyone look up at the buildings, notice the sky bridge and wondered what the heck was that? Only to be rewarded by actually crossing the bridge as Abby. I don't think I noticed him as Ellie. Did you? Yeah, no, I didn't. Wolves don't look up. There we go. Nope. <laughs> Uh, yeah. James Rodriguez writes in and says, During Abby's section in the hospital, you have to turn on a generator to restore power. However, if you go back to Ellie's section in the hospital, after she drops down to the lower level with Nora, one of the guards chasing after Ellie asks, What is the power doing on? Little things like this made me really want to go back and replay this when it's all said and done. Since it feels like there are so many throwaway lines and moments during Ellie's section that will suddenly have new meaning now that we see at what Abby was doing and what her motives were leading up to everything. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to replay it. I'm sure there's so many things that we mm-hmm. miss with The Deepest Dive. And that's yeah. why we're announcing today The Deepest Dive is going to be on a loop. We're going to go play mm-hmm. it a second. No, but that would be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andrew Baker says, am I the only one who thinks that the stalkers that hide in the walls that you first encounter on the way to the hospital with Abby are so annoying? I'm all for jump scares, but when these guys can literally ruin a stealth section and there's no way to kill them without alerting the other clickers, it drove me crazy. Yeah, this was like this was like kind of the test case for like, oh, I should just not really worry about being seen and just shoot everything like the second yep. I get to it because it's fine. Like you're like the tension that comes from like, what happens if I get spotted? It's like that's what's supposed to happen. I think that's where yeah, just shoot them. Like <laughs> that's what the champ says as well. The champ writes in and says, "Did anyone just chase the stalkers around with a shotgun? The stalkers were never a threat to me. Once I realized I didn't show up in detective vision, I said, F it. I just grabbed my shotgun, charged in. Whenever a stalker popped up." shotgun it was kind of funny because the stalkers were running for me i felt like han solo chasing stormtroopers in the death star mm-hmm. i don't fear the infected since most of the, them all they can do is just run at you um yeah there are so many there are so many jump scares in this section with abby but i thought they did mm-hmm. at least that very classy good move of there's a moment where abby goes stop doing that like the exact moment that I, it happened to me like after the fourth one or whatever but to andrew's point here you can stop them. Like I did start then when I would die and restart it, I would take like my silenced pistol and shoot them in the head before they popped out and then they wouldn't pop yeah, out. Yeah, so. those are the wall ones. Yeah. Basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you you can shoot them although you have to figure out if it's actually one or if it's not one, which is which can be Yeah. Tricky. That's the I, weird thing is that like the, you're supposed to basically shoot every time you see a wall, but like they're so they're they're I feel like they're too well hidden in that like like when you pop out and you like kind of reload the checkpoint to see if it you could have seen it. I guess technically, but there are others where it looks exactly like that, but nothing happens. So it just feels like you're sort of half guessing if you're going to shoot every time you see a wall or like a wall that looks like that. Yeah. But I, but I would say that I like I really like that kind of bombed out apartment building that you went through. Where basically like the entire you know like core of the building is gutted and you're kind yeah. of going back and forth between the two different sides like that was yeah a really interesting area and really creepy and it, yeah. it had a lot of very challenging sections in it so yeah cool design yeah. for sure 
Uh, Eric Reed says, The hospital basement is probably the most scared I've ever been playing a game. They absolutely nailed the atmosphere. Getting to see late stage infections where people had grown into and around gurneys was disturbing. Uh, if you look... Oh, and then he goes on to, to other things here. The boss fight versus the fungus meatball was super intense. It's the only place I've experienced multiple game overs. I used pretty much every resource I had to kill it and the super stalker that came out of it. If you look at the hole where the fungus meatball comes from, it has a rather distinct shape. Combined with the blood, it is clearly meant to evoke thoughts of being something being freshly born. Given that this is a site from the oldest infection area, does this mean that the fungus is potentially adapting to mammalian breeding? It could be a disturbing focus for The Last of Us Part 3. A lot of stretches there. Um, let's focus on the hospital to begin with. I also thought that the environment was amazing. You know, slightly spooky E.T. vibes, trying to turn the power on like Jurassic Park. Like, as a Spielberg fan, I love that area. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it really reminded me that, you know, like both of these games have been horror games, but ultimately this was the first time where it, was, where it really felt like, okay, like Naughty Dog is really embracing kind of the horror roots of this series and and yeah. making kind of a a classically creepy environment that you have to kind of stock around in and i really appreciate that and i was freaked out the entire time yeah and, and yep. the, the entire time i was like oh god like i'm gonna have to turn on the power and there are all these monsters down here like i don't want to do this <laughs> mr hammond i think we're back in mm -hmm. business yeah and like even on the way like you see that insane room with like that hole in it with the blood smear the genova mm -hmm. blood trail coming out of that hole and so my thought was okay i'm gonna explore the rest of this place but i think i'm gonna have to crawl into that hole i think that's where i'm going but lo and behold you did not have to crawl into the hole mm -hmm. but yeah. I, I don't know about the idea of mammalian breeding but i do think it is that interesting idea that they're trying to set up about since this is the start area ish of the infection overall that if things go long enough some really effed up things can happen here, uh, which is a, a resident evil stuff. It, you know, it feels yeah. so resident evil. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I mean, Fred DeNovo says, I love the Rat King boss fight. A lot of people call it the Rat King. Is that the name of it somewhere? Uh, Anyways, I'm not uh, sure. I love the Rat King boss fight. I know they can't do B.O.W. bosses. Do we know what that means? Uh, by organic weapons. It's a Resident Evil thing. Ah, like a giant snake, giant shark, like Resident Evil, as The Last of Us is a slightly more grounded reality. But they found a way to, within their own mythology, justify a boss fight. I don't know. The fungus combined in on itself. There's good enough justification for me. And one thing I felt was really lacking from the first game, slash first half of this game, was an elevated encounter that wasn't just waves of enemies plus a couple of shamblers bloaters. Yeah, I was I was fully in. I wasn't taken out uh, at all from the design there. That was really cool. Matt Parsa says the hospital monster gave me extreme inside vibes. Uh, without spoiling anything there, why? <laughs> yeah, who can say? Um, yeah, I I thought that boss was awesome. It's like when he was busting through the walls too. It's like, oh, this is almost a better nemesis than Nemesis from 2020. <laughs> it's pretty impressive overall, but it is super Resident Evil. But then even I thought it was brilliant that idea of the super stalker like branching off from him and then that being used mm -hmm. later to like show you where to go where he's like scrambling up into the vents and stuff like that's such a brilliant little touch yeah and yeah. and that was that was just so unnerving of like you blow a whole nother creature out of this thing and it scurries off into the dark too <laughs> and so now it's like jesus now there's like another enemy out here somewhere right, that i'm like right. just dreading popping up at me yeah yeah Throughout the entire the entirety of this uh, section, right after like the uh, you're in the the ambulance and you get the stuff, uh, that entire section I was just on edge. Yeah. Uh, to a point where like I've not I have not been on edge uh, throughout uh, the rest of the game uh, to that extent. Mm. To where I was like, I am holding my breath the entire time. I can't. I am just like focused, like laser focused. I don't want to see what happens when I lose. Oh, like I don't want to. I, I don't want to see that. So throughout that entire time, I was like, I can't lose. I cannot lose. Uh, and fortunately, I did not die throughout that that whole thing. And it was just like on the edge of my seat. I could not. 
uh, I couldn't focus afterwards. And I was just like, I need to take a, like, catch my breath after that. Yeah. Um, it was just really intense. <laughs> uh, Cloudy calls it the amalgamation abomination. And they, they weren't a fan because they were like, it's just a bullet sponge. I loaded all my stuff into it. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I died so many times. It was a weird moment where at some point, Abby says, like, my bullets don't seem to be doing anything. Like, there were a couple of those weird cues where I'm like, should I just be running? Okay, there's that first part where you are running away from it, got it. But then even during, like, okay, this seems like the arena, not the fake-out arena with, like, the cars and stuff, which was cool to have that that wasn't actually the real arena. But then when you get to the real arena, then she still had a line about, like, my bullets are ineffective or something. I was like, oh, it seems like you're giving me a lot of ammo in these rooms. Seems like the thing you Mm -hmm. want me to do is Mm -hmm. to shoot, but I don't know why that line is there then. Yeah, that's a, that's it's definitely like the most video gamey moment. And by then, yeah. I I it felt like there was them like yeah, this is a shooter basically like acknowledge, yeah. acknowledging that like they're kind of done with stealth at this point because Abby's more of an action oriented character. But uh, I didn't hear that line though, like the bullets are ineffective. But that was definitely like where I thought it, because it was a Resident Evil boss, I was kind of looking for a weak point. Yeah, where it's like oh, you have to get up behind it and it's got like a glowing red spot. But yeah, it turns out you just have to shoot it a whole bunch. Or like you know, I threw pipe bombs and used flamethrowers. Um, yeah. But I, I I don't know if there's maybe they're just saying like hey, use the flamethrower because the bullets don't work and maybe the flamethrower oh, is like especially effective. That could I mean yeah, yeah I, I didn't die once from this thing and I I flamed the hell out of it. Yeah, I think uh, the flamethrower is really effective. Uh, I actually. I learned this, uh, that the flamethrower was really effective against, I believe it was a bloater, uh, in the, uh, skyscraper. Uh, there was like somebody off or it was a bloater off to the side where you didn't actually have to kill him. But, uh, I ended up using a flamethrower on it. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is really effective. Uh, so then when I got to that boss, I was like, save all, uh, save all flamethrowers for that. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, then it, it definitely helped out. I think it got it down from its first phase of the uh, boss relatively quickly. I definitely had a, yeah. a nemesis moment too, where after it died and it was just sitting there, I'm like, no way this thing's coming back. Right. Like it has to grab my <laughs> leg or something. Like, oh, no, it turns out. Mm-hmm. And also <clears throat> like walking around that area with the flamethrower as Abby, it, it reminded me of the thing again. It was so cool. And, and this is a <laughs> dumb thing. I can't imagine this is reference to the thing, but it reminded me of it as well throughout the section with Lev where Abby kept calling them scars and then mm-hmm. uh, Lev kept correcting her and saying, what are they? they're Seraphites. Like that going back and forth, there's like that same rhythm as in the thing when he keeps me like, ah, he's crazy Swedes. And it's like, they're, they're Norwegians, Mac. They're Norwegians. Like throughout that entire movie, just that quick back and forth. <laughs> Anyways, that's enough of the thing. Uh, we're saving the thing for a future Deepest Dive, so please look <laughs> forward to that. Um, Steven Zerilli says, I played the game on baby mode so I could fully enjoy the story, but the boss in the hospital basement is still a one-hit death. Can I just throw out a big thank you to the devs for making games still have the tension and thrill of a victory be very present, even when playing on very easy? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I played the first game on easy, fake ass gamer, I admit it. Um, and it was really, it was striking as well that the clickers, it's still like one hit kill for them no matter what. So it's interesting even for a boss like this, that if he touches it, you're dead. Um, Clayton Myers says I'm an extremely anxious person who doesn't find the stress of stealth horror games fun so with games like this I usually drop the difficulty as down as far down as possible I was playing on very easy but decided to mess around with the accessibility options for some of the infected encounters turns out you can make yourself completely invisible while prone which completely broke the game for me crawling up to every enemy executing a stealth kill became repetitive and openly crawling my way through every encounter was hilarious but made me feel too disconnected from the story it's the only game, only time I've ever been, I've ever made a stressful game too easy to be enjoyable. That's interesting. Uh, and then Clayton just talks about how amazing the accessibility features are, which a lot of people have written in about as well. But yeah, I didn't know that you could do that where you're just invisible in the grass. That seems seems like a fun way to kind of break the game, but I'm yeah, not you, interested. You can also set it so that I, the listening mode lets you ping items around you in right. like a pretty large area. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then... You get on the boat and you go back uh, to the hospital here for the end of, of day two. Or sorry, back to the aquarium. And the music on that boat ride back I thought was uh, super, super great along with a lot of the music overall. Which mm-hmm. reminds me of Finlay here. They wrote in saying, you mentioned that the electronic music that is more present than in the first game 
And I wanted to provide a bit more information on that since I find it interesting. Uh, Gustavo Santolala, sorry, the composer's name, I can't get it right, uh, returned to compose for this game, but Matt Quayle, the composer of Mr. Robot, which appropriately has a predominantly electronic soundtrack, was also hired to work on the music. So presumably all of the cool new electronic pieces are composed by Matt Quayle, which is quite a departure from... Uh, the first composer's method of composing all of his gorgeous, gorgeous tracks by playing physical instruments and objects and without reading or writing sheet music, as I understand it. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Uh, Charles, you're a bit of a composer yourself, no? Yeah, uh, a little bit. Yeah, you wrote the amazing soundtrack to Hyperdot, which is also available on Steam and stuff as a standalone thing. Um, yes, it is. Has the soundtrack stood out to you here? Uh, yeah. Um, so there's been, well, there's been a lot of like diegetic things. Again, the uh, the Ice Cube song that still is yeah. something that has stood out to me being like oh that's great um, but the actual score of the game has been like I I think it's a little uh, it's it's hard for me to accurately judge whether or not it's super like super effective because it's a super effective score I think it is <clears throat> but there's also like when I hear the Last of Us theme I'm like oh this like there's a lot of emotions that uh, it evokes just because it's the Last of Us theme, and I have a lot of like attachment to it. Yeah. Um, so well, whether it's like trying to evoke that theme or something like that, like uh, like you mentioned when it was uh, riffing off of that theme. Yeah. Uh, earlier, it was like, oh, I I don't know whether or not this is like super like impactful for just the a person who isn't as into like the last of us or or whatnot but like yeah the 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 score so far has been like super impactful uh and it's also helped um ratchet up the tension especially in like the the sections like this in the hospital um where i've been like oh man this is like super uh super effective in terms of trying to make it so that i'm on edge or i'm really tense especially after i get found then it's like, oh, I'm super uh, tense, and it go and it like dies down again, and they're just looking for me. Yeah, yeah. that's that's when it's super. It's really good, really good. Absolutely. Uh, Hans Kleinenberg says, "I'm not moving fast enough to keep up with you guys exactly, but as an overall observation, holy hell, the amount of unique assets they made for this game is astounding. Absolutely loving it so far, including playing as Abby." Uh, but am I alone in saying that this game is way scarier and more tense than the first one? I feel like. I like it more than the first one so far because of that reason, and I can't wait to see where it goes. I, maybe I'm just, uh, I've grown a lot, but I find it a lot less tense than the first one overall. Where is everybody else with that? Yeah, I, I definitely find it less tense, and I think mostly that has to do with me, like, more, I've been able to, like, kind of let go of, like, trying to be, you know, the perfectionist stealth person, um, and basically just being, sh- uh, you know, shooting more often, basically, uh, and that, I feel, has removed a lot of the tension. Um, to where, like, I, I don't know that I'm, like, uh, at, like tense at all in, the, like, the last few encounters here where it's, like, on the, uh, especially, like, on the ship yeah. where you're kind of working through all these infected. Like, I just, like, basically rambled my way through that entire section. Just, like, crossbow, pick up the crossbow, bow, or the, the bolts, and just basically, just, I basically just marathon my way through that one. Um, and so, like, without kind of, like, the impetus to do stealth, I don't feel like it is as much of, a, like, a scary game maybe you need to play it on a higher difficulty to serve fiber i guess i could give it a try but i don't know like i I, i'm not enjoying the combat enough to like try to like make the game harder i'm fine where it is at this point but it like there is that weird lack of tension for sure Mm. uh saint 947 says the thing that is absolutely the most standout of this game beyond the photorealistic graphics of the of a street in the rain is the sound design in one of the apartments in seattle before going up the stairs i heard the runner breathing upstairs the room felt so stuffy that i could hear the labored breathing even if he wasn't groaning or whatever sound they usually make it's absolutely stunning work through and through from the sound design team uh yes i love that just picking up on those they're usually pretty good about if you enter a house or a room with infected they'll give you just a little heads up before you even go to like Listener mode is usually some audio clue that something's in there. Um, Joshua Wilgenin says, I've become obsessed with Abby's braid physics. Most developers would just make the ponytail bounce up and down while running, but not Naughty Dog. It has its own physics and reacts to how the player moves the character. It can be positioned in front of either shoulder or behind either shoulder. I find that the backpack tends to push it in front of her shoulder, and in my experience, it's usually the right one. 
I'm not sure if it's biased this way or if it has something to do with how I'm playing the game, but where things really get wild is the cutscenes. It's my understanding that the cutscenes are rendered in real time, so you'd think the braid would start where it was just prior to the scene and react only to her movements. Not the case. If Abby is off screen for a fraction of a second, her hair will switch shoulders completely unprovoked. Worse, when it switches sides, it doesn't have any residual movement from the rapid position change, as if it's teleported. I would chastise Naughty Dog for missing this detail in an otherwise very detailed game. However, for this change to take place, an animator would have to manually move her hair during the cut. What does it all mean? <laughs> Now, this is the deepest dive, but uh, Josh, you may have hit the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> uh, that said, I also, I do look at her braid a lot and think about like, oh, every once in a while. I think the most jank in the game overall is that braid jank. Yeah, I think it's the most jank that you see constantly. Yes. Yes. It's constant, yeah. just flavors of jank, a hint of jank, <laughs> a whiff of jank. <laughs> Uh, Shatterhand yeah. wrote in, it says, With this segment, we've reached the most offensive thing in the game. The collectible coin for the state of Illinois has the gateway arch on it. That's supposed to be in St. Louis, Missouri. And later on, Abby finds the Missouri coin and it just has a picture of a bird on it. Why is it the arch on this coin? What is going on? P.S. You literally have to dive deep for the Illinois coin. It's at the bottom of a swimming pool. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I have been waiting for the Minnesota coin. And I haven't found it oh, yet. Oh, please have it be in there. Every, every time I find a coin, I'm like, come on, Minnesota. Yeah. And <laughs> we haven't gotten it yet. Yeah, it's funny. There so was like fun. a really tense moment. I forget exactly where it was. And then suddenly it was like, ooh, Wisconsin coin. Like, it's just like to have that complete <laughs> pivot. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Um, it's bringing out all the nerds here, though. That's what we're doing. This is a nerdy channel. Zachary Sweet also wrote in and said, in the flashback is Abby, we pick up a Virginia state quarter dated to 1978. Well, the U.S. didn't start making state quarters until 1999, and the Virginia one didn't come out until 2000. <laughs> Upon some research, Neil Druckmann was born in 1978, and Naughty Dog was founded in Virginia. I don't think this forgives the blatant disrespect to coin collectors, but it does cool. seem intentional and not a mistake. Okay. Very important work from everybody here. Yes. Um, as always, thank you to everybody that supports us on Patreon to listen to this, or that supports us on Patreon to submit a comment fantastic comments thank you to everybody for playing along thank you for everybody being a good sport and not spoiling things in the comments um this deep in the youtube video i think only cool people are left so thank you for being cool for watching this um if you would like to submit a comment now to spoil everything don't do it in the comments below but please submit it on patreon on monday when we have the post saying hey we're covering everything else in this game we're finishing the game with the next discussion. So if you have thoughts on the game's ending or anything in the chunk that we haven't played yet and you want us to read it out loud on this show, you can support us at any tier on Patreon and then leave a comment on Monday when that post is up and we'll read it. And Jeff will okay. give you his special so, link. Uh, I, have a, I have a quick question. Where's the cutoff here? So is the cutoff... Uh, on the, yeah. It's, um, it's like... It's not, I, it's I not where you think it is. It is okay. after the credits roll. If there's any post-credits thing, it's after that. Then it's after you've not put your PS4 in rest mode, shut off your PS4, walked outside, looked up at the sun, and did the Joel ah, hand over the face. Ah, the okay, yeah. Then okay. that's the cutoff for the next discussion of the deepest dive. Yeah. Don't spoil anything that happens in your life after that. Yes. Yeah. Please don't. Seriously, be cool. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about the length of the game and stuff. Seems like people are ready to go with a lot of thoughts on that. Oh boy. I had a moment during this section towards the back half of it where I was like, just had that weird epiphany of, hey, remember Dina? Remember? <laughs> it, just, yep. it feels like a different game. It just feels like yeah. so long ago that I was invested in Dina's storyline. Yeah. Yep. Who do you yeah. Dina when you got Owen, right? <laughs> Demo? I don't well, know. Well, we don't have him now anymore yeah. either. So. Why? What happened? Oh, no, that's right. <laughs> My murdering hands. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, anything else anybody wants to say about this section or the grand finale coming up next week? I'm very curious to see where a lot of the, the balls that it threw up in the air in this section end up landing. But uh, yeah. yeah, I, I, I want to see how this ends. Uh, very yep. interested to see how they how, like where they go because it seems like very expected like oh the last thing is going to be like a fight between abby and ellie and i would imagine that they're going to try to subvert that a little bit so curious to see how they do that i mean yeah this is a place for predictions i guess i i think we're going to get back to that scene 
and something then will make them unite. I think uh, their mom was both named Martha. There'll be something yeah. that will connect them, and then they go and fight Isaac, and that's going to be the end boss is Isaac. Um, but a lot of those details are a little bit vague. And then because they both have that connection to Fireflies, then they both get in the boat and go to Santa Barbara. With Owen? With Santa Owen's uh, head? Yeah, 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 with Owen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Dina, maybe? Oh, then Dina can hang out too. <laughs> yeah. Or like, yeah, okay, so... Ooh. That baby's getting named in this game, isn't it? Who is mm. she going to name that baby after? Yeah, see. It works if it's a boy or a girl. Mm. Oh, that's good. Be nice yeah. if she did. Elena. Didn't. What was it? Elena. Nathan. Yeah, that'd be really nice. Yeah. Uh, we're no. we're going to name you Nathan Drake. Yeah. Or do you think she'll be like... <laughs> Loads up the start screen for Uncharted 5. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the game is so long. Do you, yeah. do you think at the end of this game, Abby and Ellie are both standing? Uh, I'm going to guess no. I'm going to guess no. You think yeah. Ellie's going down? No, I was just going to... One of them. Make the guess. Dead. Which one? Uh, I think I think Abby dies, and you're supposed to feel real bad about that. Yeah, I I feel like there's a strong chance that Abby can get infected since she can get infected. Oh, yeah. interesting. Maybe Isaac mm. killed her. Ooh, there, there, there's mm. gonna there's gonna be a bite, and Abby's gonna tell Ellie that she has to take care of Lev. Oh, that would be so hmm. bizarre. Yeah, are we just kind of done with the scar stuff at this point? Well. Well, hang on, because there was that conversation about how Abby was going to the island or something that we talked about last time, and now we know this kind of yeah. scar stronghold. So, oh, because that's where the invasion's happening, and that'll be the climax yeah. is the invasion, and so it'll just be scars mm. and Isaac and everybody there with Abby and Ellie. Hmm. Yeah, I can envision a gameplay section where you are switching back and forth between Abby and Ellie. Oh, that'd be cool. That would be pretty cool. It's just like oh, hot no, swap no. where you're like they're punching an infected back and forth and it switches a character perspective with each oh. punch. Yeah, it well, does I that. mean, what it does is it goes to the like the, the world ends with you perspective where you're right. controlling both characters and you have to use the touch screen to control <laughs> yes. Ellie. And on the top, you're like mashing out instructions as Abby. Right. Every, all the cool, the coolest people who listen to this understand that reference. Yep. That and then, y- yes. That and then you're good. also playing the guitar as Ellie is attacking as well. And that's also <laughs> yeah. on the touch screen. That's her yeah. gameplay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Abby has like coins as her only uh, use of ammo, so you have to you have fifty coins yes. to kill Isaac. Oh, that's yep. perfect. That's All perfect. the coins you've picked up. So if you didn't yeah, pick up, she hits coins. him with a sock full of full of pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine like the the aiming on the sock is she's like holding <laughs> the sock, and it looks exactly like the arc for the bottles. Yeah. You have to throw the weighted sock everywhere. Okay, hang on. Now, now this is gonna be diabolical. Let's all come up with the best pun. After she hits Isaac with a sock full of state quarters, um, what can she That's say? That's change you can believe in. <laughs> That's good. That's good. The oh, gate was in was St. Bad. Louis, Missouri, not Illinois. <laughs> Nailed it. Oh. Mm. 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 I want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, we got to... That was like bad. you are a dime a dozen. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that would have worked. Ah, oh, good. No, well, I've, I've failed this. You're lucky this we challenge. didn't have you drawn and quartered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I, I had can't. a nickel for every time I had, I tried to hit you, I don't know. <laughs> Ellie will draw him in her journal, and then Abby will quarter then, Yeah. Oh, okay, that's perfect. Great. Yes. Uh, leave your best... Comment below for what to say when you hit somebody with a bag full of state quarters. <laughs> We're looking forward to reading those comments. Thank you so much, everybody, that has been along with us on this journey. And next week next week is the grand finale, so it should be a good time. All right, thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Do you want to get your name or Twitch or YouTube channel in the description of everything we release? Record a podcast with us, put a picture of your choice on MinMax's TV or a whole lot more? You can check out the benefits for supporting us on Patreon. If you support MinMax at any tier on Patreon, you can submit questions or comments for us to read on the air, and you'll also get access to the wonderful MinMax Discord. We need your help to keep this whole indie trainer rolling, so we'd appreciate it if you checked us out.